Good morning. Today is June 18th, Friday, June 18th. Uh, the Board of Ada County Commissioners are in session to uh, conduct its uh, hearing on uh, budget presentations. Um, I might, uh, uh, at the outset, however, make it make note that uh, uh, yesterday President Biden signed a uh, a law making a new holiday on the 19th of June. And uh, Governor uh, Little signed an executive order indicating that it would be implemented immediately. Most cities and counties, including Ada County, cannot implement it that fast. There's, there's driver's license <laughs> appointments. There's all kinds of stuff. And so uh, today is, uh, is a normal uh, business day, and we will, we will uh, consider that as, as, as a potential uh, holiday in our, in our uh, personnel matter. But, from, but today is, uh, is a normal work day for Ada County. Uh, so just so everybody knows that, have, and it's clear on that. Okay, Kathleen, we're ready for you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Steve Rutherford, Chief Operating Officer, is representing Commissioners Rod Beck, Ryan Davidson, and Kendra Kenyon, who are responsible for the Commissioner's Office, General, and the Veterans and Public Health Funds on behalf of the Ada County Commissioners, who are one of seven constitutionally elected offices within Ada County. The Commissioner's Office is broken into two areas, Community Programs and Commissioners. Community Programs are programs that benefit Ada County as a whole, such as the Humane Society, Animal Shelter, Senior Contracts, U of I Extension Office, Family Advocates, Compass, and Allenbaugh House, to name a few. The Commissioner's Office oversees the operation of 13 departments, acts as a Board of Equalization, provides oversight for the Fair and Emergency Medical Services Districts, and adjudicates mm -hmm. indigent claims. They serve on various other boards and committees, a few which include Compass, Valley Regional Transit, and the Catastrophic Health Care Costs Board. Additionally, the commissioners are responsible for all county contracts, ordinances and resolutions, grant applications, and overall direction of Ada County. General covers costs associated with the offices and departments within the general fund. Costs such as litigation and attorney fees, postage, unemployment insurance, excise tax, and carries a contingency appropriation should the need arise. The county also budgets the funding for its capital projects in this department once the new fiscal year has arrived, the funding is then provided to the Capital Projects Fund to fund those projects the board approved during the budget process. The Veterans Fund assists in the maintenance, upkeep, and repair of servicemen memorials within Ada County. This funding is provided directly to the American Legion posts as requested and directed by Idaho Code 65, 102, and 103. And Public Health Fund provides the county's portion of funding for services provided on a re regional basis by the state of Idaho. This funding is provided directly to Central District Health as directed by Idaho Code 31862. The commissioner's budget or department in current expense, part of that 3% cap, was submitted for FY22 at 3,452,945, 31,412 over the appropriation total, there's one supplemental for the various community programs um, that are involved there, capital crimes, defense, the STAR seniors, U of I, um, emergency management, and COMPASS for 35626 Budget to actual information is below from FY17 to FY20, FY21 adopted budget, FY22 is submitted. You see the number of employees listed there. General uh, is a department within current expense as well. The budget for FY22 submitted at 4,038,661, 1,314,900 over the appropriation total. On the personnel side, there is a supplemental for contingency to add 100,000 using fund balance. That is above and beyond the contingency that we put in place for the 2% holdback. That is about 400,000 that we do just in case there's some department that goes over their 98% that Phil talked about on Monday. There are four supplemental requests here. Uh, the first one for professional services for the master's facility plan and aerial photos, uh, one time for 200,000. General liability insurance, $18,112, which would be ongoing. Records and books, 10,000 would be ongoing. And then contingency appropriation, 
uh, putting a million dollars in the budget by using fund balance. So if the need arises, we have it budgeted. Budget to actual for the history of the general fund. And of course, this fund has no employees. Public health is a special levy fund. So they are still part of that 3% cap. The budget for FY22 was submitted at 3065241 over the appropriation total. That's the additional funding for Central District Health. And I understand that they have reduced that, but this, I think, to about six something. But this is as of submitted, so we'll address that during deliberations. You can see the budget to actual history below. And again, no employees in this fund. Veterans is another special levy fund. The budget submitted for FY22 was uh, 20000 As you can see, it's been 20000 for many years now. And again, no employees. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Rutherford, who will present these budgets. Thank you. That's me. Commissioners, good morning. Good uh, morning, there are, Steve. There are donuts over here. I go better with sweets. Um, you made it through almost through a week of presentations. Um, <clears throat> thank you for having uh, Elizabeth and I uh, to present your budget to you. Uh, we're happy to report. Uh, we're probably not going to use the full two hours we've been allotted. We'll probably get you out of here 15 <laughs> or 20 minutes early. Um, but before we, before we go into our, our presentation, first a little bit of recognition. Um, Phil, Kathleen, thank you for keeping this train uh, rolling. This is uh, an overwhelming process uh, with a lot of moving parts, and you and your staff do an exceptional job, so thank you. Commissioners, your staff, uh, you have a, a, a band of people upstairs that uh, help Elizabeth and I do their jobs. Quite frankly, we all couldn't do our jobs, you included, uh, without them. Um, your office manager, uh, Judy, uh, exceptional at uh, organizing the work, directing staff, training. Um, she also tells me no uh, quite frequently. Um, Sandy, Annie, and Matt, who are upstairs, just do an incredible job for you and the taxpayers uh, of Ada County. They deliver customer service with smiles every single day. They are cross-trained, they're collaborative, they are helpful, and, uh, and they also, as you know, like to have a little bit of fun. So, we'll jump right in here. So just generally about our office, uh, we do have a mission statement. There are core values listed here from the 2025 strategic plan that was a kind of a countywide endeavor. But I will tell you upstairs, uh, the folks I just talked about, uh, led by Judy, uh, we drive hard towards delivering exceptional customer service to you and to the taxpayers, the residents of Ada County on a daily basis. Uh, we strive to be efficient and responsive, again, both to you uh, and those that require or request our services. Our long-term goals, uh, and these are holdovers from last year, are really to, to prioritize capital improvement funding. Um, there are some big ticket items on our master facilities plan list, and that takes some foresight and some planning. Last year, the board put aside $6 million. You'll be similarly up, uh, you know, poised with that, uh, that question. Uh, during your deliberations to fund uh, those those big time capital needs. Similarly, deferred maintenance, uh, very important to be good stewards of the, 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 the resources the public gives us, which includes our facilities. And so replacing uh, roofs and maintaining uh, electrical equipment, uh, you know, doing regular scheduled uh, maintenance is important. Um, and it's vital to protect the assets and prolong the lives of these, uh, these assets that the public has provided us. In addition, environmental responsibility. You heard uh, Tom Audi earlier in the week talk about the landfill and preserving airspace. And so diversion is important. And that, that kind of tracks clear back to what we do here every day at the courthouse, even in our break room. We've got the garbage can with the orange bag in it. And so we can make a difference in saving uh, airspace to the landfill and prolonging the life of that public asset. You heard Bruce Crisco earlier in the week talk about replacing, kind of systematically replacing the lighting fixtures in this facility and in other county facilities with LEDs, both to drive down uh, the, the power bill and to increase efficiency. Uh, those are all important. Um, 
In terms of our metric for success, uh, last year we had uh, a sur surveys, first one being citizen survey. Important to ask our citizens what's important to them, uh, what we're doing well, what we could use uh, help on. Uh, those sorts of, that sort of information helps you all prioritize uh, Precious County resources and make good decisions. Um, we also uh, didn't get to us an employee-wide survey. We'll, we'll blame COVID, uh, but um, we did not do a county-wide employee survey, but we should. Uh, employees are our most valuable resource, and we should ask them how we're doing, how they're doing, what they need to be able to do their jobs better. And as you all discussed before we went into the budget, ask them, what can what efficiency measures uh what what ideas do you have to to improve delivery of services or cut costs that's really important they're on the front lines they're experts they know those jobs better than anyone else um, in addition uh we feel really good to be asked those questions and so we want to do that finally facilities uh we want to make sure they're maintained and operate efficiently i'm here to tell you that operations does an amazing job you have provided operations with the resources to, to procure facility dude. Uh, that program has been kind of a game changer for Bruce and his folks in terms of uh, continuing to maintain these facilities. Um, you have uh, provided them resources to, to hire, trained, hire and train uh, staff and accordingly, they provide a really good product. Switching gears to uh, accomplishments besides the hundreds of uh, BOE appeals, the countless OBMs, the thousands of contracts you approve, what has the board accomplished in fiscal year 21? I just lifted a, a handful. Um, the first one is residents of Ada County really value open space and recreation and wildlife. Uh, this year, the board took two very important steps to preserve and ensure these values are protected for years to come. The board approved a resolution designated, designating the Barber Pool in Southeast Boise as open space. Under the management of uh, Scott Coburg and the Parks and Waterways Department, this property will remain open to the public uh, to, observe to observe wildlife and recreate uh, for years to come. Similarly, the board approved uh, resolution 2591, preserving the Red Hawk property as open space. Uh, here's a picture of it here. Red Hawk is a property nestled between Avamore and Hidden Springs. The property was acquired by the county in 2012 via a foreclosure sale. Uh, it was originally uh, supposed to be a subdivision, um, but the county picked it up um, uh, in that foreclosure sale. And now Ada County residents can enjoy trails on this property, connect vital connections to Ridge to River trails, uh, wildlife, and again, enjoy, enjoy much needed open space between uh, what are some really kind of densely populated areas. One that I'm particularly proud to have been a part of, uh, thanks to the board's leadership this year, Ada County applied for and received over $16.5 million to help Ada County residents impacted by COVID. Ada County called upon our very own housing authority to get the funds into the hands of residents that couldn't pay their rent or utilities uh, due to COVID. Uh, the city of Boise followed suit and similarly contracted with the housing authority. What has resulted is a one-stop shop for all Ada County residents in need of this assistance. Finally, uh, the program is a great example of the power of collaboration. Our communications manager, Elizabeth Duncan, has worked tirelessly with the housing authority staff and the public information officers at the city of Boise to develop really professional messaging and push it to every corner of the county so everyone knows far and wide about this program and isn't left behind. They even, uh, they even did a, a commercial. A notable accomplishment for all Ada County elected officials this year was the creation of a citizens committee to study elected official compensation. Again, this was a result of not only the commissioners but the other elected officials here in Ada County. Uh, the commissioners uh, eventually appointed, after we created it, uh, appointed five Ada County residents to serve four-year terms. Their charge was to develop non-binding compensation recommendations for the county's elected officials. Historically, the board has used its budget to support worthwhile communities uh, within our, our bigger community. Seniors, uh, as Kathleen mentioned to you, uh, you support uh, senior centers in the cities of Eagle, CUNA, Meridian, and Star, and this provides a place for seniors to go and some programming in their, in their community. Uh, the board has long supported the family advocate and children 
uh, uh, the Family Advocate operates the Guardian Ad Litem CASA program. Uh, and Guardian Ad Litems and court appointed special advocates are, are essential to providing and to protecting and advocating uh, those children who cannot do, th do so for themselves. Allen Baugh House, a great example of a partnership. The City of Boise, Meridian, Health and Welfare, and our Housing Authority uh, provide uh, a facility for, for medical detoxification. Uh, before this existed, before this partnership existed, that, that was happening at emergency rooms and at the jail. Peer wellness uh, is the county support for mental health and folks that are uh, dual diagnosed in our community. This is an increasing, uh, uh, increasing and increasingly important mission and the county uh, provides support for that. Finally, Central District Health. Um, you have supported Central District Health. In fact, you provide the lion's share of the budget for that. Um, they proved uh, very important during COVID, but, but they do other important things too. Septic systems, uh, STDs, they inspect restaurants, and uh, Commissioner Beck mentioned to me that they actually even uh, administer the WIC program, which I didn't know. Uh, at this point, uh, where we're still talking about accomplishments, I'm gonna turn the time over to Elizabeth Duncan, your communications manager. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I get familiar with this little thing real quick. Good morning, everybody. Um, as I listen to each of the budget presentations that have happened this week, I'm struck by the number of services and programs that the county provides. I'm also struck by the difficult decisions that you as elected officials have to make. No one out there is asking for fewer services or less access. I feel for you as you make your tough decisions. For anyone to benefit from the volume of services and programs that Ada County provides, they have to know about them and understand them. And for the public to know about and understand these services that we provide to them every single day, we have to go to where they are. The public's attention span, our collective attention span, is being consumed more and more. Everyone wants your attention. Getting you to click on something is the most important goal of the digital information economy, and that economy is all about information. We all have limited bandwidth. That is why we go directly to where the public consumes their information, and 72% of the public consumes their information, their news, from social media. Let's zip through some of the platforms that Ada County is using successfully. Next door is where you plug into what is happening in your immediate neighborhood. Whether it's a lost cat or someone looking for a handyman, it is your neighborhood social media platform. When we post important information here, we generally reach about 160,000 homes. So imagine you want to know why your property tax assessment is so high. This is a good place to get that. Imagine that there's a flood. This is where evacuation routes would be posted to affect those people immediate or affect those people directly. We had enormous success posting information about the weekly numbers on our emergency rental assistance program or ERAP, and we feel that that is one of the reasons the success rate is so high. Twitter, love it or hate it, it remains a very popular platform. There are many people, including reporters, who use this religiously, so we post there again because we have to go where people are consuming their news. Facebook, we are now up to 6,300 followers on Facebook. We want those numbers to be much higher. We've gone from about 4,000 to 6,300, so we're going in the right direction. Instagram is one of the platforms that we use quite frequently. As you know, it is more picture focused and it's generally not used for complex issues. We try to direct people on Instagram back to our homepage. So you'll read on a lot of our Instagram posts, click link in bio for more information and then they go to our homepage. YouTube is such an important tool for the board and for all of Ada County because People like to see videos. They would rather see a video and hear from somebody than read a lot of text. So we're using that more frequently. <clears throat> the Ada County homepage is the un 
unsung hero of our messaging. This is our workhorse. It is such a great site and incredibly easy to navigate. We still do have improvements, but it has turned into a swan in the last year, and this is because of IT. IT does an incredible job, and they are so helpful, and their expertise is so much appreci appreciated. They provide the best customer service and make sure that Ada County looks good. By the way, that Bluebird image up there, um, that whole image on our homepage was provided to us by Joshua Brown in operations. He is a professional wildlife photographer, and we're going to be using his images to update our site seasonally. Elizabeth? Yeah. I attempt to stop the noise. Okay. I just thought that was somebody just trying to interrupt telling you. me to get off stage. <laughs> get out of there. <laughs> Okay, um, if you would like to follow Joshua on Instagram, his handle is Bayou Josh, as in Louisiana Bayou, and he has some beautiful pictures of all throughout Ada County. Getting people to read, watch, and learn about the county is an ongoing, relentless task. Success is often measured by the aggregate of the marginal gains. As with any successful company or political figure for that matter, consistent messaging on social media is oxygen. We're very fortunate in Ada County to have a board that is very uh, tech savvy. You guys all have your own social media platforms. You use them. You know the importance of posting there regularly. Gone are the days of news releases. From 10 years ago, you had a PIO, you had a communications person, they sent out a news release, they waited and hoped for somebody to pick up that story. We don't do it that way anymore. Regardless of your views on news in general, they are a tool as well. They are our megaphone. However, the blessing with social media is that now we can be our own news outlet. That is what Ada County will continue to pursue. One of the accomplishments that I'd like to talk about is something that you heard about on Wednesday, which is the Joint Information System and how it functions so effectively during the coronavirus pandemic, the height of the pandemic. Back in 2019, the board um, was very supportive of reaching out, of me reaching out to each of the six sister cities, ACHD and other agencies like school districts, and asking them to be part of an ad hoc group called the Ada County External Communications Team. And the reason we did this was purely for self-interest. We don't have a lot of resources. We don't have a lot of staff. So we have to all help one another. So for instance, in going out to Eagle and Star and CUNA and Meridian and Garden City and talking to their public information folks, this group, the Ada County External Communications Team, came together and was able to help amplify each other's messages. So if I had something about the fireworks ban, I would reach out to Eagle and say, hey, can you post this on your social media? They'd reach out to us and say, can you post, a, post information about fun days on, our, on your social media? So we really were able to amplify each other's messages and it cost nothing. It was just us collaborating. So then when coronavirus hit, we had something in place. We actually had a structure in place so you could reach out to these people and they folded effortly into the joint information system and we're very pleased about that. That's just a few of the um, public information officers or the agencies that public information officers worked with that were part of that joint information system and that were originally, in many cases, part of the Ada County External Communications Team. So, in closing, I just want to remind um, the board, and you guys know this, as I mentioned, because you are very um, tech savvy, that if you don't define yourself, someone else will define you. And it is a relentless daily task to make sure that everyone in Ada County knows about the services and programs that we provide because we are a service-oriented organization. Everything we do, every single thing that Ada County does is about providing service. One of the reasons this is so important right now is because we have so many new people moving into Ada County. We have to educate them on what we provide, how we provide it, where they can get the service. And so I appreciate the fact that we are committed to making sure that everything that Ada County does is shared with all our residents. It is a great pleasure to work on this every single day and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, I'll define uh, our budget for, for FY22, if you'll permit me. 
Uh, we'll move through this fairly quickly. It should be familiar to you. We have 10 um, folks that work upstairs, you three, and then we have seven, uh, you have six staffers currently. We do have one vacant position that's been vacant this entire fiscal year. Uh, that amount uh, of 846,717 is, is what it costs for all of us. Uh, we have operating uh, both the commissioner's uh, budget, including legal publications, property insurance, our membership to Association of Idaho Cities or Idaho Counties, uh, conference expenses, as Kathleen talked about, the Humane Society, our general fund uh, operating expenses, professional services that benefit the entire county, Sterling Cotter Fire contract, and, uh, and those contingencies for both operations and personnel. And then we have the special levies that, uh, that Kathleen mentioned just moments ago. In terms of new requests, uh, these supplementals, I'll just, I'll just cover a couple. Uh, feel free to ask questions uh, if you have them. Currently, we fund Star Senior Center, or you fund Star Senior Center at $16,000 a year. They've asked for a $2,000 one-time increase this year because they need to replace the stove. Uh, which is probably an important expense. So the board gets to make the decision about that and whether it's ongoing uh, or whether it's a one-time. In addition, uh, we're worthy of note, Central District Health, the, the actual uh, increase is $689,563. It was gonna go up $67,000 and change anyway this year, but then the legislature kind of swooped in with House Bill 316 and now we own, we own the obligation for an additional $621,800 um, long, long in, into the future. Other supplemental requests, as Kathleen uh, mentioned, personnel contingency and, and, the, um, and the general contingency fund, which actually came in really handy during COVID. We had to buy a lot of PPEs. We were far enough through the budget term that that, that we didn't have the, the money on hand for that. I believe we even bought a, a refrigerated trailer for the coroner's office using those, those funds. Um, the master facilities plan consultant, that isn't actually an increase. We're moving that from the commissioners to the general fund uh, and that funds some, some third party um, services we have to, to pursue the master facilities plan, whether we build, lease, out finding property, um, that is a not to exceed contract and they just bill hourly against that. We don't actually spend anywhere near $100,000 a year for Mr. those services. Yes. Didn't, um, Steve, wasn't it in there for 200,000 on a previous slide? No. Um, so Kathleen in that slide had master facilities plan and fleet management, I believe, or no, man, uh, master facilities plan and aerial photography grouped, but no. That contract with well, Compass is- Well, aerial photography is down here with Compass, which is my, was my next question. Right, I've got, I've got that, that um, sheet that Kathleen showed, and let me see here. Yeah, you showed professional services at 200. I just wanted to yeah. make sure we get the right number plugged in. She has, in the general, she has professional services, so the master facilities plan and aerial photos as 200,000 uh, one time, so those are those are our group just for convenience. But ultimately, that's a hundred thousand separate for the aerial photography endeavor, and the master facilities plan is a contract for just a hundred thousand dollars. And those are those are separate, but they're in the same. Okay, fund. was that Bob McQuaid's part of Bob McQuaid's? Yes, yes, got it. Yes. Okay, and that's what this aerial photography slash compass is is for the drone footage for assessments. Yes, got commissioners, it. Okay. that's. That is exactly it. They are going to kind of systematically aerial map the entire county, and Bob McQuaid has asked that we partner with them because uh, various offices and departments, including him, use those uh, on a regular basis. And so why isn't all of that in the general fund? Why is, why is it coming out of the commissioner's office again? Uh, those two are coming out of the general fund. Those are both in the general fund. The master facilities plan when we started the project was in the commissioner's budget. This year, we're just moving it to general moving fund. Moving it over? Yes. Um, and finally, uh, general liability insurance, an increase of 18,000, uh, and those are cost increases associated with general liability that aren't attributable to one single office or department. As I mentioned earlier, the Citizens Advisory for Elected Official Compensation spent countless hours over three months. Um, they, they gave uh, richly of their time um, to review uh, the elected official jobs, uh, speak with the elected officials about what their jobs are, uh, and study market comparables. 
Thank you to Matt Reed and Andrea Byrne in uh, Human Resources. Similarly, they gave richly of their time and accordingly the committee developed a report and these non-binding compensation recommendations in time for Phil to include them uh, as part of our budget discussion. Finally, uh, during that same time period, I engaged a Human Resources Department to uh, do some market analysis for department head uh, compensation. Um, it's vital that we remain competitive with our uh, compensation in Ada County, especially our department heads. You've heard Bethany talking about the, the job market and, and the way we get, are gonna get employees and the way others are gonna get employees is poaching them. Uh, instead of getting them from the couch, we're gonna get them from other employers. And, and I, I can tell you for sure that our department heads uh, will receive calls. They, they will. They are a talented group of people. You've heard from them this week. I, uh, I hope you will agree with me that uh, we are blessed to have this talented group um, who are good stewards of the public's resources, uh, who have a passion for their mission, and uh, have a passion for um, their employees as well. So we need to uh, do what we can to retain these folks. These, uh, the, the, the market analysis included all department heads. These were the uh, the ones that um, HR and, and I recommend you consider for, um, for change. That's all I've got, but I'm happy to answer Can questions, and Elizabeth slide? is here too. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes. Quickly? Got it. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Are there any questions from the commissioners? This thing on? Mr. Chair, I think I've already asked mine. You've already asked your. Do we have an Idaho Statesman uh, uh, subscription? <laughs> you. You. I actually tried to get uh, Steve O'Meara to let me piggyback yesterday, and he subscribes to something else, not the Statesman. So uh, you'll have to wrestle with Judy over that one. Well, <laughs> no. Do you have any questions, uh, Commissioner Davids? So you listed just the Star Senior Center. Don't we contribute to a few different senior centers, or are those in a different part of the budget? No, yeah, we do absolutely, Commissioner. Uh, we give twenty thousand. Uh, last year we gave twenty thousand to Eagle, fifteen thousand to Cuna, sixteen thousand to Meridian, sixteen thousand to Star. Mr. Chair. Yes. So Commissioner Davison, I think the the only reason the two thousand is showing up separately is they're asking. A uh, one time above what their normal allocation okay. is, and that's for that stove top. Just for a stove. Uh, and they need a stove. Stove. Stove or stove top, yeah. Mr. Chair, I have one more. Okay, just a minute. Um, and Go one ahead. of the things that we may want to discuss amongst the board during deliberations is the, the one position that has been vac vacant for a year. That's a uh, policy and financial analyst position, and I think we need to make a decision on that um, probably during deliberations. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we have that teed up as one of the, yeah. when we go through all the positions, we've already got that teed up. Okay. Thank you. And um, yeah, just going to our uh, social media, thanks Elizabeth for, for your presentation. Um, one thing I've, I've noticed, some of our Facebook posts, I don't think they're getting the traction they might. So I would like to see maybe us put a little bit more money towards the social media to boost specific posts to get just a wider distribution. I just hate, putting a whole bunch of effort and making a video or something and then putting it up there and you only get a couple views. So I'd like to see us maybe just spend a little bit more money on um, social media to get our, to get the word out. Um, you previously mentioned, uh, you know, we asked uh, employees for ideas on how to cut or trim or ideas they had, um, and which I thought was a great idea. I think legal, a bit of a wet blanket when, you know, we kind of, kind of kibosh that a little bit because of certain legal considerations, but I do think overall we should be very receptive when, you know, employees, staff members bring us ideas, um, you know, just to improve county business in general. And um, yeah, how, how is our, uh, the fleet management um, coming along? So th that, that will be basically one centralized location to manage all vehicles throughout the county, correct? Yes, Commissioner. And actually, now that you mentioned that, I ha uh, was going to going to have a quick conversation with you about that. Um, we have put in the budget 100000 for a fleet management consultant. Uh, just to have someone come and kind of do some analysis and tell us what benefits would kind of follow uh, the adoption of, of a fleet management program, 
cities, counties, organ public organizations our size have fleet management programs uh, for that exact reason. Centralized, instead of departments and offices being responsible to procure and get rid of their vehicles, maintain them, you have central, it's centralized, we have one place where we go get tires, we have one place where we get lubes. Um, there will be cost savings. This report um, will be able to tell us um, what that would look like, what we can expect. It, it will likely in include um, some policies and some recommendations about how we staff a fleet management uh, program. Um, so the plan would be, if, if approved in the budget, to start a group of department heads and elected officials having discussions about um, uh, levels of interest, who wants to be involved, and then doing an RFP to get a consultant on board. Okay. What were some of the factors that caused the budget to um, increase from 2019 to 2020? 2019 to 2020? Yeah, we took a big a jump from uh, 19 to 20. Well, some, it was some jump. 18 and 19 was about the same, and then was it largely COVID stuff with Central District Health, or what were... You know, Kathleen is whispering in my ear that it was uh, the set aside of the, the master facilities plan, the money for master facilities plan, the master facilities plan consultant. We added um, uh, a couple of employees uh, that year, but really big ticket it was. Yeah I, yeah, I guess the question is, are you looking at the general general or commissioners? Oh, uh, the commissioners. Oh. I think we had, if I remember right, Judy, we had a couple of positions that weren't filled and then we filled them the following year. We had, uh, so the Jess Osla originally was in our, uh, in our um, office, that position was, and he transitioned to be kind of a shared position between ops and, and the landfill. Um, mm. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Steve, I'd have another question, if we can. Yes, sir. <laughs> on this, on this uh, fleet management, is that going to buttress the uh, the sheriff's fleet management? Because he's obviously got the largest fleet. Are we going to be? Uh, is he going to be? Uh, is the sheriff going to be part of that fleet management, or are we going to add that to to us? How are we going to do that? Um, Chairman, uh, really good question. Um, so we have we have talked to the sheriff's fleet manager person. I have spoken to the to the previous sheriff. Um, and uh, I don't think uh, there was initially interest in, in folding things together. There might be now. Um, they have a software system that, that they've already procured that we, can, that we can piggyback on, we can use. So that won't be an expense. Um, it makes sense at some point to get to a fleet management system at the county, uh, if that's the direction you all choose, and it includes everyone. It's not uncommon for law enforcement to be late adopters in terms of jumping on board with the rest of the organization. Um, I know the city of Boise had that, and I believe the city of Meridian had that, where they had to get it up and running, show the law enforcement the value of it, and then they jumped on board. But um, I think to gain real, well, first of all, I should say, I think the sheriff's program runs really, really well. Well, it seems like they're showing us the value of it. They are, they are. <laughs> so uh, ideally, we would get there. Right, all right, well, I, I just, I mean, they're all county vehicles, and so we just need to recognize that, maybe work towards that, I, I believe. To include the landfill and EMS? Yeah, all of our, all yep. of our employees, absolutely. All of our, all of our, that's what fleet management is. It's our entire fleet, not just a section of our fleet, I wouldn't think. Anyway, do you have any, any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to thank Steve. Um, new position and uh, it's been, it's been a wild ride for you during COVID to jump into this with both feet and take on um, the position of, you know, chief operating officer for a $300 million almost company with all the employees that we have. And just hearing all the department heads come up here and sing your praises um, makes me feel like we are really in good hands. Um, the fact that we were without that position is just at this point unfathomable that we were trying to, to operate and, and give our department heads the support, um, the leadership, the strategic overall direction um, with rotating commissioners. It just really wasn't very effective or efficient. So I know that you're very much appreciated in um, all the core values and the culture that everyone has kind of teed up. I don't want to gloss that over and, and just for people to think those are a lot of words 
on paper and kind of fluff. Um, it's, it's the core, it's the backbone of the organization. It's how we show up every day to work. It's how we hold people accountable. It's how Bethany is gonna be able to actually, you know, have measures of performance and coaching and professional development mechanisms in place. It is absolutely critical. And I feel like sometimes we just throw the words up and we get right to the numbers, but the numbers are really meaningless without um, the ability to, to help folks be the best that they can be. And we certainly set the example and role model and should role model those behaviors every day as commissioners. So just wanted to say thank you for everything you've done. And again, I couldn't imagine doing this job like I did the first year without um, you in that position. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, just for the record, we do try to limit the rotation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I've served with five, five commissioners in five years, so I'm just saying it would have been really difficult without Steve. But Mr. Anyway. Chair, yeah, I want to, you know, thanks you, Steve, and, and all of our staff, you know, as, as a new commissioner and Commissioner Beck as well, as, you know, we only came on in uh, January. None of the staff were anybody that we hired. It was all pre-existing staff uh, elected or hired by other boards. Um, but I think we all work together great. I love our, our office atmosphere. The, um, the workplace atmosphere is great. I think we all work together really well as a team. And that I really appreciate that because as a citizen, as a voter, reading stories in the Idaho Statesman of previous boards and employees just constantly feuding and, and inflicting that on all the uh, the rest of Ada County uh, employees, which obviously is going to hurt morale, it hurts morale in the in the community if people have to read about um, you know employee commissioner fights constantly in the newspaper. And so I'm I'm very grateful that you know through just luck on my part that I I get to work with uh, such great staff that works together so well. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll echo that. Thank you very much. I think we've, we've got a good team. Yeah, we do. Even though Judy technically works for Phil, I'm going to pretend she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, he leases her to us for a short period of time. <laughs> Just the opposite. She works <laughs> Okay. Everything coming up here? No, there's a flat budget. <laughs> All right. Adam Schroeder is the director of weed control, pest abatement, and mosquito abatement. Noxious weed control enforces Idaho noxious weed law and works to control and eradicate noxious weeds found within the county. There are currently 35 out of 67 state designated noxious weed species found in Ada County. Pest abatement provides pest control services to landowners living within the pest abatement district. Pest abatement crews manage rock and gopher, uh, gopher and rock chuck infestations that threaten agriculture or infrastructure on private and public property. Mosquito abatement provides mosquito surveillance, monitoring, and control services to taxpayers living within the mosquito abatement district. Mosquito abatement works within an integrated pest management plan to mitigate the impacts of West Nile virus and other vector-borne diseases in Ada County. Weed is a special levy fund, part of that 3% cap. The budget for FY22 was submitted at $1,156,058, 75,000 over the appropriation total. There are three supplementals on the operating side, one for a field inspection vehicle, 35,000 one time. A field application vehicle equipment, 20,000, that would be one time they're suggesting using fund balance for that. And then eight tough books, the mobile application and field data collection, 20,000, again, using fund balance. You can see the budget to actual information below and the number of employees remaining consistent at 14. Pest is one of your special taxing districts. So they have their own 3% cap like EMS did yesterday. The budget for FY22 submitted at 719,891, 20,570 over their appropriation total. They have 21 supplemental for 25,000 that would be ongoing for uh, temporary labor. So just a contingency note, not knowing what's going to happen with the labor market. And then the budget to actual information over the course of the years and the employee count, they're remaining consistent at two. Mosquito is uh, the final special taxing district that we have. 
The budget for FY22 submitted at $1,340,677, $26,775 over their appropriation total. They are requesting uh, one supplemental for the use of their fund balance at 100,000 for emergency operation contingency. So if we ever need to have to do aerial applications for mosquitoes, we've got that money set aside. At this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Adam Schroeder who will present you these budgets. Thank you. Welcome, Adam. Good morning. Good morning. I hardly recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's a compliment. Thank yes. you, Commissioner. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman Beck, distinguished members of the board, Commissioner Davidson, Commissioner Kenyon. Uh, early greetings for happy Juneteenth and happy <laughs> Father's Day to you guys. So. Um, I would like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the weed pest mosquito abatement proposed FY22 budgets. It is my honor to serve the citizens of Ada County in my role as director of these fine departments, and I am humbled by your continued guidance and support. At this time, I would like to recognize the employees of Weed Pest Mosquito who inspire me every day in their efforts to serve Ada County, and I'm grateful to be able to represent them today. What a great group of people, just absolutely the best. Um, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the following folks who have always supported our agency and continually find ways to help us improve our standards of service. That's Clerk McGrain, Madam Controller Graves, uh, Tim Sturgis, Lori Beck, uh, Treasurer Mon and her outstanding team, Prosecutor Bennett, Heather McCarthy, Claire Tardiff, Erica White, Lorna Jorgensen for always being in our corner. Um, Director Callie, Jessica Donald, all the fine folks in HR. Director Perkins and his excellent procurement team. We've all heard about how great they are. Uh, Director Osla, Bruce Crisco, Martin Van Horn in operations who have been incredibly helpful in all of our facility endeavors. Uh, Director Coburg in Parks and Waterways for his continued partnership in Ada County Land Management. Uh, I would also like to recognize Mr. Steve Rutherford and you, the Board of County Commissioners, uh, for everything you do, not only for our departments, but for the taxpayers of Ada County, we appreciate your service and support. So thank you. If it pleases the board, I would like to provide some background information on Weed Pest Mosquito as an agency and then move through the budgets for each department. I will follow up with an update on current projects and close with some lessons learned. As you know, our agency is comprised of three separate and distinct departments. The three departments um, share a facility and an administrative staff. We are one of very few agencies in the nation that has a structure where special taxing districts and general fund uh, departments cohabitate in, um, in pest and animal and insect abatement. So even though our business processes and legal requirements are very different for each department, we can combine resources and increase our capabilities, allow for greater efficiency and get better results with lower costs to the citizens of Ada County uh, through our shared efforts. Weed Pest Mosquito has 22 full-time employees. There are nine full-time folks who work in noxious weed control, one full-time employee for the pest abatement district and five full-time employees in mosquito abatement and seven of us who are funded out of all three departments. I'll begin with uh, noxious weed control. Uh, noxious weed control is funded by special levy within the general fund that is supplemented with enterprise fees that we collect performing noxious weed control services for private citizens, commercial businesses, and public agencies. We serve the entirety of Ada County, and our primary mission is to act as the enforcement agents in Ada County for the Idaho Noxious Weed Law and Idaho State Department of Agriculture Administrative Rule Set. With enforcing the noxious weed law, our mission is to also provide effective noxious weed control services to the citizens of Ada County with the goal of enhancing our community's quality of life. The core values of our agency are aligned with Ada County's core values. That's, those are humanity, excellence, integrity, trust, and stewardship. Uh, the core values in noxious weed control that I would like to bring your attention to this morning are trust and stewardship. Noxious weed control is difficult and thankless work. Often folks are not very happy to see us and uh, they're unsure of how we're gonna treat them or what they can expect from us as an agency. 
So we work very hard to communicate well with our constituents and build an atmosphere of trust so that they know that we will honor our agreements, uh, provide an assistance first attitude in our interactions and work as stewards of lands where no one else can or is willing to. Mr. Chair? Yes. When we were at a conference in Coeur d'Alene recently, the Noxious Weed presenter told us that uh, the county, I think under Title 22, has jurisdiction over all weeds even in the municipalities. Do you know if that's correct? That is, Mr. Chairman, yes. Commissioner Davidson, that is correct. Uh, we are the uh, enforcement agents for the Noxious, Idaho Noxious Weed Law, which is in statute and then uh, empowered by the Idaho uh, State Agriculture Rules. So yes, we are in control of all noxious weeds within the county, whether they're in the municipality or unincorporated data county. Thank you. Our directives are simple. We comply with all laws, regulations, and codes, particularly as they pertain to the application of pesticides, as well as supporting the rights of property owners and holding folks accountable to responsible stewardship of their lands. We find and identify noxious weeds, Currently we have 36, we just found one, of 69 prohibited species occurring in Ada County. So once we find them, we make plans uh, to control each species according to a predefined set of guidelines listed in our, our action plan. We also work to educate folks on the dangers of noxious weeds, how they can damage our ecosystems, decrease biodiversity, harm humans, livestock, pets, animals, uh, wildlife, agriculture, or property. Uh, we work to stay current with the science of noxious weed control, including pesticide technology, herbicide resistance, GIS, IT applications, integrated pest management methodologies. And finally, we work to support our people in enriching their, their professional knowledge base and in the pursuit of their career goals. These directives have metrics that are listed in our strategic plan and are reported in annual reports. I would like to share with the board a few key statistics from fiscal year 2020. We took just over 1,900 calls for weed control, including public complaints. We created nearly 400 complaint work orders and sent almost 300 enforcement letters. Of those enforcements, 113 work orders were created for control actions over 200 acres of property. We completed over 1,400 work orders and collected over $216,000 in enterprise revenues. In terms of production, uh, we treated nearly 3,000 acres of noxious weeds and mapped more than 600 new noxious weed infestations within the county. And you might notice that acronym EDRR, that stands for Early Detection Rapid Response. Those are noxious weeds that are new to Ada County or are not currently established. EDRR weed infestations are our most urgent priority. We currently have five EDRR species that we are contending with, and we just had one detection of a new noxious weed, uh, musk thistle new to Ada County, at least, uh, near the uh, highway corridor in North Eagle. It was only one plant, but we will be monitoring that area and the corridor just to make sure that plant doesn't get established. We treated 27 acres of EDRR infested property in FY20, and there are a few notable changes in these statistics as compared to FY19. We're seeing a significant increase of public work orders requested, acres treated, and enterprise revenues are also up. I think that the public demand for weed control has risen due to our increased population, as well as an influx of folks who are buying these uh, medium-sized properties um, and trying to learn how to manage them. Uh, we are also fully staff staffed in FY20. That also helps with our production numbers. Here are a few shots from the field. On the left, you will see a nice rush skeleton weed plant overlooking the valley. In the top middle, you will see a yellow star thistle growing along a fence line. Yellow star thistle happens to be our, one of our most difficult EDRR weeds uh, to manage, and we are taking aggressive actions in North Eagle to eradicate this plant. Uh, top left is a shot of purple loosestrife. And on the bottom left, you will see that uh, photo of the maturing puncture vine seed, that one everybody hates. <laughs> Um, and in the center is the scotch thistle bloom, and on the right you will see one of our applicators treating a white top infestation. Mr. Chairman, as you remember, the West Ada Fuel Station expense and revenue is included in the noxious weed budget. 
We operate the service. Uh, we operate and service the West Ada Fuel Station to help provide fuel dispensing services to all Ada County departments and offices. This is not a for-profit venture. Uh, the station generated around 130,000 in growth, gross revenues in FY20, and we charge five cents on the gallon to keep the station in good repair. Uh, we're just now starting to feel one of the primary COVID-19 impacts as related to the increased fuel consumption and higher fuel prices. Uh, in order to keep our folks safe during the uh, pandemic, we uh, were complying with the CDC guidelines and local mandates, which we had our field crews caravanning to work order locations, which caused an uptick in fuel consumption, of course. Um, combining the early season fuel consumption with increased higher, uh, higher fuel prices, we've spent more money than we should have by this time of year, um, and we'll probably have to do some shuffling to adjust uh, uh, those lines. The fuel station, uh, we looked at it and it has distributed about 3,000 more gallons by this time of year than the average has been for the last three years. So that's just for your information. The FY22 expense projection is $138,000 and revenues listed at $120,000. Mr. Chairman, we have no new personal uh, request, personnel requests to present to the board. We do, however, have some increased operating expenses that we are requesting as supplementals. We need to replace one of our aging trucks, so we're request, requesting a one-time increase for $35,000 to do that. We cover some pretty rough country in those trucks, and we do our best to maintain them. Uh, but there are some vehicles in the fleet that need to be replaced, and I'm trying to do those at about one per year. We're asking the board also to approve fund balance supplementals for new field application equipment. That's like pumps, steel, um, flatbeds, plumbing equipment, that sort of thing, as well as new Toughbook laptops. Uh, those requests are for $20,000 each. Our personnel request is $691,152, and our operating request is $464,906, with $75,000 in supplementals, bringing our total request to $1,156,058. The fund balance for noxious weed control stands at $966,695. And if it pleases the board and there are no other questions, I'll proceed to pest abatement. Are there any questions before we proceed to pest abatement? I don't think so. Go ahead. Thank you. The Ada County Pest Abatement District is a special taxing district that includes all of the unincorporated areas in Ada County highlighted in the map on, on the map in blue. The PAD is tasked with controlling pocket gopher and rock chuck infestations on private land within the 894 square, square mile district. I included this photo for some folks who might not know what these rodents look like or why they need to be controlled. On the left, top left, that is a pocket gopher, and directly underneath you'll see one of those mounds there. Uh, one gopher can create a burrow system of up to 2,000 square feet underground and create up to 100 mounds. Uh, and they're prolific breeders, so they tend to cause a lot of problems. Um, on the top right is a yellow-bellied marmot, or what we call a rock chuck which can invade rock or wood piles and might even dig under a house or a shed. Their tunnel systems can reach up to 230 feet per animal. And once they're established, they can cause extensive da damage to foundations, irrigation canal banks, underground utility lines, vehicles. They love to eat the fuel lines and the coolant lines out of the vehicles, um, not to mention gardens and agricultural crops. So if you look closely at the photo on the bottom right, you will see a pair of marmots that has dug under that person's patio. So they can undermine the foundations pretty easily. The, the PAD's mission is to, bait, to abate pocket gophers and yellow belly marmots that threaten agriculture or infrastructure while providing value to, and outstanding service to the district residents. One of the core values I would like to highlight as related uh, to the pest abatement district folks is integrity. The PAD seasonal employees are a great group of people, many of whom return every year to serve the citizens within the district. They are often folks who have retired from other jobs and are not necessarily dependent on wages, but they return because they, because they have hearts for service. They're extremely capable when it comes to abating these pests, and they work hard to build trust with our customers and do the best they can to help folks who are in desperate need of service to protect property and lands. 
We follow the law. We take work orders from district residents, control harmful rodent populations, and we educate folks on how to manage pests for themselves. We also work to stay current with integrated pest management trends and work hard to help our folks stay licensed. We also do our very best to provide the kind of working environment that helps folks want to return because they're important to us and we want to keep them. Here's a short summary of some of the work we completed in FY20. We answered over 2,000 phone calls for requests for service. We completed over 2,300 work orders, including almost 2,500 inspections and over 7,500 acres treated. Admittedly, we saw a significant de decrease in key production statistics for FY19 uh, from FY19, and I'm confident we can attribute those to three factors, uh, COVID-19, software development issues, and a slow but steady increase or uh, increase of agricultural land development. Also, we are seeing a de decline in new clients per year, which means that one, we're controlling more infestations and rodent populations are decreasing, they're not spreading. Uh, and also that uh, two, that many of our agricultural problem areas are being developed into subdivisions. So as you might notice, this is dirty and physical work. Our field technicians uh, surveyed large acreages and identify and abate pocket gopher infestations mound by mound. This is the type of work that many folks nowadays are unwilling to do, but is absolutely necessary and essential to protect agriculture and property as well as preventing disease. Our budget request for the PAD includes no personnel changes and our only supplemental is for a temporary labor contingency. As you are well aware, we've had to increase wages across the spectrum of seasonal positions to bring folks on board. Because we were so tightly budgeted in those lines, uh, the increase in wages has led to a reduction in hours that we have avail available to fund. Uh, so this contingency will help us uh, help cover those increased wages while moving forward so that we can provide services at previously established levels. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you might notice that there are two supplemental amounts listed on this slide. The difference is that we're asking for an ongoing supplemental of $25,000, but we found a little over $4,400 within the appropriation to help with that supplemental this year. Personnel request is $234,205. Operating expense request is $485,686. Our total FY22 request is $719,891. And the fund balance for the district stands at $1.4 million. If there are no other questions, I'll move to the Mosquito Abatement District. Thank you. Go ahead. The Ada County Mosquito Abatement District is also a special taxing district. We provide mosquito abatement services to all the folks who reside within the 400 square mile district. The district is essentially comprised of all the incorpor incorporated areas of Ada County highlighted on the map in orange. Within the abat uh, abatement district, there are three sections of service, surveillance, which is how we trap and speciate mosquitoes, as well as identify hotspots of mosquito activity and test for presence of disease. The larvicide section serves to identify and treat mosquito breeding sites throughout the district in order to prevent hatching of adult mosquitoes. Adult side section serves to abate adult mosquitoes as either a, either a, a request for service or in response to a West Nile detection. Commissioners, the MAD's mission is to control mosquitoes that are both a nuisance and potential vector of disease to Ada County residents using the best available data and sound science practices through integrated mosquito management principles. The core values I would like to highlight as they pertain to the MAD are humanity and excellence. The service that we provide is focused primarily on preventing disease in humans, we, and we take our job very seriously. West Nile virus is the leading cause of mosquito-borne disease in the United States, and there are no vaccines available that can prevent the spread of this disease. In some cases, West Nile virus can cause encephalitis or meningitis both of which are debilitating diseases that can cause permanent damage to the central nervous system and in some cases death. So although we love making summertime much more pleasant for the folks in Ada County, our job really is to prevent these diseases and help save lives. 
In order to do that effectively, we hold ourselves to the highest standards and strive for excellence in all three sections of service. We actively monitor mosquito populations throughout the district for high mosquito counts and for presence of disease. We also respond to requests from service from our district residents. You'll see that we also place a high priority on educating not only the district residents, but also those folks who reside outside the district or who follow us on social media. Mosquito abatement is a highly technical field, and we work to keep our folks knowledgeable on the most advanced science that is available. We often work with counties across the nation to share abatement methods, insecticide resistance data, fleet management, invasive species data, and other important operational knowledge so that we can all be better at what we do. The first thing we need to understand in a mosquito abatement is where are the mosquitoes coming from, which species are present, and um, are those species carrying disease? Our surveillance program is specifically designed to answer those questions and more. We set around 120 traps throughout the abatement district, and in FY20, we trapped over 23,000 mosquitoes. We tested almost 9,000 of those mosquitoes for disease and had 11 of those test pools come back positive for West Nile virus. According to Idaho Health and Welfare, there were three confirmed human cases of West Nile virus in Ada County last year, um, and we'd like that to be zero. As I mentioned before, larvicide operations are focused on finding sites throughout the district that tend to harbor mosquito development and treating them with a naturally occurring bacteria to kill the larvae. We are currently monitoring over 44,000 active development sites, and we have identified over 3,000 new sites in FY20. We completed over 125,000 inspections and over 72,000 treatments where larvae had been detected. We responded to over 500 public service requests and treated over 900 acres in total. As you can see, we had significant increases in new sites mapped, which we can mostly attribute to residential development. We find that for every, every new subdivision that is built, we are identifying and treating dozens or more new potential development sites, breeding sites, those are drain inlets, standing water sites that are a result of over irrigation or poor drainage. The final component of our MAD operations is our adulticide program. If through our surveillance efforts, we identify an area where there are high mosquito counts or perhaps high counts of the Culex genus mosquitoes, which are the West Nile virus vector, we dispatch our adulticide trucks to the area after dusk to apply ultra low volume insecticides that provide a quick knockdown to those mosquito populations. We also perform the service at the request for district residents um, or as the result of a West Nile detection. In that case, we will treat an area of one square mile around the positive pool trap um, and then make sure that those, those populations are monitored after that. In FY20, we completed over 1,600 fogging requests from the district residents and created over 580 internal service requests for areas where adults were found in abundance. In total, we treated over 52,000 ground acres to control adult flying mosquitoes. For the Mosquito Abatement District to be successful in our mission, all three sections of service must work together hand in glove to coordinate services and prioritize actions based on environmental conditions and mosquito pressure. What we saw last year was that we trapped fewer mosquitoes, we had fewer West Nile virus positive pools, and we performed fewer adulticide applications. On the other hand, we treated a lot more larvicide, uh, we completed a lot more larvicide activity, which directly contributed to fewer calls for fogging service and less overall adult mosquito pressure than we had in FY19. So it goes to show that when we can preemptively get out and treat those sites, we have less mosquito pressure overall throughout the season. Here are a few photos that might help tell the MAD story. On the upper left, you will see our larvicide crew leader riding in the UTV treating irrigated pasture land to kill larva. Upper center, you will see our mosquito division coordinator counting and speciating mosquitoes in the lab. On the upper right is a beautiful shot of what we call a wriggler or a mosquito larva. These little guys and gals wobble around in the water and attach themselves to the water surface to breathe air. Bottom left, you will see a gravid Culex pipiens mosquito. So this little lady has a blood meal, has had a blood meal, is getting ready to lay eggs, um, which brings us to that bottom center photo, which is an egg raft. 
Egg rafts float on water, on the water surface until they turn into wrigglers. And on the bottom right, you will see a photo of one of our crew leaders training a, a field tech on correct larvicide calculation uh, and application. Mr. Chairman, the MAD has no new personnel requests outside of the appropriation for FY22. We do have one supplemental request in the amount of $100,000 for our contingency line. Again, like um, Kathleen mentioned, that's just for aerial apicide uh, applications, uh, larvicide or adulticide, just in case we do have exponential mosquito population growth. Um, the request is to be, to be drawn from the MAD fund balance, which the total of which stands at $2,021,389. And for the FY22 budget request, we are asking $456,303 for personnel, $884,374 for operating costs, and $100,000 for contingency, bringing our total request to $1,304,677. Again, there's the discrepancy between the two um, supplemental uh, amounts, and that's just because we found some within the appropriation that help with the supplemental. I wanted to give the board a quick update on Alamo, which is our new web program for tracking our applications, mapping, and customer accounting and maintenance. Although we've had some early challenges, this program is like nothing I've ever seen in terms of its capabilities. Um, and because it's spatially based, that's map based, it allows us to track and document the field work we do in ways that are incredibly helpful to us and will serve the citizens of Ada County um, for decades to come. Right now, the GIS team has mostly completed pest abatement and administrative sections of the program, and we're in the beginning phases of noxious weed control focused on compliance. Here's a screenshot, and you can see that the program is web based and it's incredibly intuitive. There are several sections on the left sidebar where the user can navigate between administrative functions, map and parcel information, work orders, treatments, application history, client maintenance screens, inventory controls, and much more. So for every one of these sections, the pest abatement, noxious weed control, mosquito abatement, every one of those sections of service also has a mobile program associated with that. So they get out in the field and they do their applications and they record that information. It interacts directly through, you know, uh, web portals uh, straight to Alamo. So we can almost see what we're doing in real time and it's just incredibly useful. So at this time, I would like to take a moment to thank all of the exceptional folks at ITGIS. That's uh, Director O'Mara, Todd Buchanan, Ryan Strain, Deborah Fulkerson, Kenneth Hatke, Alex Aker, Matthew Lee, Colt Wright, Scott Thomas, and everyone else who has contributed to this project. Uh, it's truly one of a kind state of the art application and something that I believe will prove to be the envy and inspiration of other GIS teams and abatement districts throughout the United States and beyond. Something we can really be proud of. You should be proud of that. Commissioners, I thought it might be helpful for us to also reflect on some of the adjustments we made as a result of COVID-19 shutdowns and mandates. Uh, we have broadened our work from home capabilities for administrative folks and acquired the hardware to make sure they have what they need to do, uh, to do that while work, working remotely. Um, right now we have three folks who work a hybrid schedule and we have as many as five who are able. I think the incorporation of WebEx has also transformed our communications across the agency uh, and also has improved meeting attendance. You know, not everyone loves attending WebEx, WebEx meetings, but I have to say uh, that has truly proved to be a lifesaver for me and a lot of our field folks who are in the field when those meetings are scheduled, so it helps out a lot. Um, our FY20 travel expenses were also significantly reduced uh, as many of our trade conferences and continuing education events were migrated to an online platform. This is a trend that I hope will continue to some degree, there is certainly value in meeting and learning uh, in person. Like Elizabeth mentioned, uh, we have escalated our outreach activities to some degree as a result of the pandemic. Our program and education specialist has created several videos that can be seen on our YouTube page. These are videos that teach folks how to trap and bait, uh, trap and bait pocket gophers how to learn about noxious and invasive weeds and find out more about our seasonal larvicide positions. Uh, we have also turned to Nextdoor to help us get the word out about West Nile virus positive detections. 
This platform allows us to notify and inform constituents at the neighborhood level, which has proven to be extremely effective. We will continue to evolve our online presence and we look forward to meeting with folks in person at the education on, with our education trailer at the Western Idaho Fair this year. So looking forward to that. Mr. Chairman, I would like to close with a comment through our ups and downs and all of the challenges we have encountered uh, and surely will continue to face. We at Weed Pest Mosquito are committed to serving the folks of Ada County and helping prevent disease and property destruction in the best ways we know how. Again, we are grateful for your support and look forward to a better and brighter future for all of our constituents. And with that, I would stand for questions. Well, thank you. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the board and the citizens of Ada County are happy that you're there and you're doing a great job and we appreciate all your efforts to rid us of the noxious weeds and the, and the, and the pests and, the, and the, particularly the mosquitoes. And I think it's one of those uh, jobs that's, that's quietly done that not a lot of people pay a lot of attention to it, but they're happy that it's there. And I can put me in that category because I didn't even know where your, where your offices were until we got this job. And I've been very impressed with your, with your operations and your, uh, uh, the way you do your business. And I'm sure the citizens of Ada County are impressed as well and appreciate, appreciate it. And as a matter of fact, I grew up on a farm, so I thought I knew a lot about, about uh, chemicals and so forth, but I knew nothing about chemicals when we started uh, opening the bids. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? What is this? Thousand dollars a gallon? <laughs> Some, you've got a wide variety of product that you need to to fulfill your your obligations, and um, and I just want to thank you for the job you're doing and for your your organization. It's uh, it's uh, it's impressive to me. I don't. One question I would have is I talked to you earlier about about this, and uh, in your early intervention with mosquitoes, you said you were having a very difficult time with getting. Um, people because they're seasonal work. How did that work out? Have you been able to, to uh, Mr. get Chairman, enough people to do, the, to do the job that you need? Mr. Chairman, thank you for the compliment um, first off. And then secondly, as far as our season, seasonal larvicide positions, we have filled all but about three or four. I think we have kind of folks that come and go. Uh, we have some folks that we have recruited internally uh, you know, friends, family members, just anybody that we can get in the door. And we have uh, somebody, uh, Miss Jolie Hudson, one of our administrative folks who has recruited about three or four people for our larvicide positions. And, and uh, uh, so, you know, throughout the efforts of all of our folks and, and the contractors and all of the outreach and, and your assistance and guidance, we've been able to, um, it's helpful. We're still down a couple, but but we're in a much better spot now than we were three weeks ago. Well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Are there questions from the commissioners? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think as impressive as the um, the building and, and the facility is out there, which is amazing when you go out there, it looks like a chemist science building, right? Um, just as impressive, I think, as Adam's leadership. I would call him a very kind of humble leader. Um, he was accepted into a very prestigious leadership program this past year, and so congratulations on that. Um, you. you and I had a brief conversation, uh, I believe it was budget last year, and I can't believe it's been that long ago, um, about my concern about all the cheatgrass. Um, and if, if there's anything that we can proactively do instead of wait till it burns and then maybe plant something else, but it's such a noxious weed and it's not good for wildlife and habitat, it's been flammable. So let's talk again about cheatgrass and where we're at and if we need to start looking at being perhaps more proactive. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Kenyon, yes, there are options available to us. Um, some of them probably less advisable than others. Uh, as far as what we can do at a county level, we do have the power, you have the power to um, uh, declare noxious weeds in your county. So uh, in, a, in addition to the ISDA rule set, which lists all of the noxious weeds, we can also um, declare noxious weeds here in the county. Um, so that also has tied with it control measures and responsibilities that go along with it. So we have to consider those very carefully. Well, maybe then what we need to tee up is a, a separate meeting with you to kind of go through what you see are the priorities and if we do need to be adding anything 
uh, to that list, but I know that, you know, we've got so many, I don't know how many acres uh, are in cheatgrass, but it's, it's substantial and it's, it's yes, ma'am. So. Yes, Thank you. Please. I'd like to make it. Noxious. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Davidson, do you have any questions? Well, thanks for all your good work. Your department really does help contribute to the quality of life of, of Ada County. Um, you know, I grew up in a, in a city that had a big mosquito problem and, um, you, I just don't ever really notice mosquitoes anywhere in Ada County. Um, certainly not like from where I came from. Uh, so I think, yeah, people don't think about your department because there's a lot less problems because you've taken care of them. Um, I would love for you guys to maybe brainstorm ways to get the community more active in uh, noxious weed control. Um, you know, just come up with some ideas for community involvement, you know, maybe like a, a countywide noxious weed festival or, or something to encourage people. Maybe on one day we all take out our weed sprayers, we go on the sidewalks and the streets and properties around our neighborhood and just, you know, all, all knock it out in one day. I think people would, would, you know, like to be empowered, you know, learn about, you know, what pest or uh, herbicides would be good for them for their home use, what kind of sprayers to get. Uh, you know, maybe they could go to your office and check out a sprayer or you could sell them a sprayer. But I think if we um, empower the community, they'll, they'll be happy to uh, uh, join with your, your mission, especially on the goat heads, because that's one that, you know, everybody is concerned about. So, yeah, if you guys want to maybe come up with some ideas over the next year and, and uh, let us know. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Davidson, that's an excellent idea. We always are trying to uh, focus our outreach and extend that outreach as far as we can. Uh, we do have a great program and education specialist who does that digital stuff for us, as well as the support we receive from Elizabeth. So yes, I'm sure there are things that we can do and, and we look forward to doing that. But to also for those folks who are, who are listening on YouTube right now, if you do have weed control issues or you need advice or you need some kind of ID uh, identification or anything uh, associated with weed control, we're here to help. So please call our office and we'll have folks get out there and take a look and, and help in any way we can. Can somebody bring a sample of a weed to your office? I know a lot of people bring that to our U of I extension office to get a, a, an identification, but can, can your office identify for the public species of weeds and give people advice if they come in? Chairman Beck, Commissioner Davidson, yes, that's absolutely what we do. We get them all the time. We have samples all around, scattered around our desk with dirt and everything. I'm sure the janitors don't like us, but uh, yeah, we identify weeds for folks on a daily basis. All right, thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Thank appreciate you. Your, uh, appreciate your, your support. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> with that, we're going to take a 15-minute uh, break.
Uh, well, good morning. We're back on the record after a brief break. Uh, we're going to start right up again. Uh, Kathleen. Mr. Chair. Scott Coburg is the Director of Parks and Waterways. The Parks Fund accounts for the operation and maintenance of Barber Park, the Barber Park Event Education and Events Center, the annual Boise River Float Season, including equipment rental, concession and shuttle services, several miles of Greenbelt Pathway, the Oregon Trail Recreation Area, the Eagle Ada Eagle Bike Park, Hubbard Recreation Area, and Victory Wetlands. Parks is also responsible for management of two newly created open space and conservation areas totaling 285 acres, Barber Pool and Red Hawk. The Parks Director is the designated county representative for the Ridge to Rivers Partnership, which manages over 200 miles of multi-use recreational trails in the Boise foothills. Waterways accounts for the installation, operation, and maintenance of over 100 recreational dock strings at 16 recreational sites and four access ramps at Lucky Peak Lake, which encompasses mm. three por uh, portions of three counties, Ada, Boise, and Elmore. Waterways is also responsible for management of the county's vessel fund and provides monetary support to the boater safety and patrol programs initiate by, initiated by the Ada County Sheriff's Marine Patrol. Parks is a special levy fund, uh, part of that 3% cap. Budget for FY22 is submitted at $2,241,092, $856,000 445 over their appropriation total. There are personnel requests, uh, supplementals for three new positions, a waterways, ma a waterways maintenance supervisor, trail trail crew maintenance leader and program and education specialist for 178,293. And then there are two uh, supplementals on the operating side, Barber Park Pathway areas five and six, 650,000. They're requesting the use of their fund balance. And then uh, temporary payroll for seasonal parks and green belt and trails, 30,000, which would be ongoing. Below you can see the history of the budget to actual from 17 to 20. FY21 adopted and FY22 submitted, and you can see the employee count uh, consistent at seven and then the new positions being added this year. Waterways is a self-supported fund. The budget for FY22 submitted at 192 even, 2070 um, under the adopted budget for 21. Budget actual history below, and uh, there was one employee and that's being transferred over to the Parks Department for FY22. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Scott Coburg, who will present the budgets for these departments. Good morning, Scott. Welcome to our board. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Parks and Waterways budget on behalf of my department and staff. Appreciate this opportunity every year. Um, I won't go through a long list of thank yous, but I do want to just uh, acknowledge, um, well, first off, it's Friday. You only have one more after me. You're almost done, so <laughs> hang in there. The real work begins next week during deliberations, and uh, really appreciate your uh, thoughtful consideration of all the budgets you've been hearing thus far. Um, once again, uh, thanks to all of my staff for the tireless efforts as public servants providing often thankless stewardship of the county's public parks, pathways, trails, and event facilities and waterways on behalf of Ada County taxpayers and visitors. Uh, I really also, typically this time of year, I like to acknowledge uh, the colleagues that do serve in uh, department director positions and also elected officials. Uh, if we kind of reflect on the last year, uh, the folks that have been kind of tasked with leading the county's uh, staff, employee services, including the Board of County Commissioners, um, but also those directors and, and elected officials in other offices. You know, we've gone through a global pandemic. We've gone through a turnover in a couple of board members, actually a few board members, including uh, Visser and Malloy. And then we've also gone through, obviously, a period of extreme growth of uh, being the fastest growing county or one of the fastest growing counties in the United States of America and being the county responsible for providing more service to more people at a higher quality and standard has been, um, Nothing short of the most challenging thing I think any of us have ever done, to be honest with you. Uh, 
and, and, and really just to watch my colleagues and the leadership that they provided during this time. Um, we really do appreciate, I will mention, uh, Steve Rutherford and the guidance he kind of helped to provide to leadership during that time as well. Uh, and of course, uh, always have to thank Phil and Kathleen and, and Tim for their support during the budget process. Uh, all around, I think the resiliency displayed by Ada County in this time and the steady hand that we've provided has been tremendous for the community. So, so once again, just acknowledgement of those folks and colleagues. Uh, and, and I will apologize to some of those colleagues as well. Some of these slides will look familiar. <laughs> they may also look familiar to Commissioner Kenyon. Uh, I try to be efficient with my budget presentations to provide you with a little bit of an overview of what we do. Kathleen mentioned it in words. I'm going to show you a lot of that in pictures. Um, some of these folks have seen these photos before. Uh, and then the numbers are new every year. So bear with me and I'll, I'll run you through who we are and what we do and then uh, some of our budget numbers and requests for fiscal year 22. Our department background includes the mission statement to provide diverse outdoor recreation opportunities with quality facilities and education at an affordable price while protecting resources and natural habitats for the safe enjoyment of our residents and visitors. The vision statement is to provide a balanced approach to outdoor recreational activities through the careful stewardship of land and waterway resources in support of our community's current and future needs. Core values include professionalism, teamwork, accountability, transparency, and stewardship. Long-term goals and objectives, some of those for our department uh, include to efficiently use the available resources, par leverage partnerships and funding to fulfill the recreational needs of the citizens of Ada County for parks, trails, pathways, waterways, open space, facilities and services. Uh, I think the, the point of what we all do uh, includes to foster as county employees and public servants, we like to foster civic pride through stewardship of Ada County parks and facilities so that Ada County taxpayers are proud to use them and also share them with others. Big part of the reason a lot of folks move to the area has to do with all the services Ada County provides and in particular parks, waterways, pathways, all the things that we're doing. We always set a high, high bar for a standard of service. I'm sure some of you have visited park facilities or public facilities that um, you recognize right off the bat. There's maybe poor management, maybe confusing management, maybe lack of cleanliness organization, we uh, do not accept those in our department and we do the best to provide the best service for all visitors. Metrics for success or key performance indicators for us include customer satisfaction and feedback, awards public recognition and positive media coverage, effective community partnerships of which we have many, facility usage, new people use those facilities we provide. Well, we're doing a good job if they do so, if they continue to come back time and time again. And then of course, revenue. Now, as I reviewed my last year's presentation, I found it interesting that I had a whole slide set on COVID-19 and uh, they're all still fairly relevant this year. So um, it was interesting. What have we learned from COVID-19? I'm gonna hit this again. Uh, again, last year, we weren't required to wear masks at this time last year, uh, we were, still dealing with kind of the beginning of the pandemic. We didn't really know what we were in for, um, but these were some of the slides I shared last year and I'll, I'll share them again with you. Uh, as far as park and recreation facilities are concerned, there were several articles um, published during that time, the beginning of the pandemic, um, and the headlines included uh, one such as this, coronavirus makes it clearer than ever, we need our parks and green spaces. And a quote from that article included, staying active, act, physically active is one of the best ways to keep your mind and body healthy. In many areas, people can visit parks, trails, and open spaces as a way to relieve stress, get some fresh air and vitamin D, stay active and safely connect with others. Now, many of you remember there was, a, there was and still is a pretty significant mental health impact to um, isolation, uh, COVID restrictions, and those things that occurred we were kind of a, a release valve for those folks. And it, it's not just having an open space, it's having a properly managed open space, trail, pathway, facility. So um, moving on to the next quote, our headline was the power of parks in a pandemic. And the quote from that article was, parks haven't gotten the attention in dollars that they deserved in the years leading up to the crisis. 
Next headline, in the COVID-19 era, a renewed appreciation of our parks and open spaces. And once again, during this time of heightened stress and anxiety, stay at home orders and social distancing, the respite provided by simple things like a walk or run in the park has proved to be more important than ever. Right now, many are dependent on parks and green spaces to provide some much needed relief mentally, physically, and emotionally. You as county commissioners are very involved in providing these assets and resources to taxpayers, to visitors, and we're gonna walk through how you do those things. Um, lastly, though, I'll share with you, again, a publication from NERPA, the National Recreation and Park Association. Um, this article included a quote, as park and recreation professionals, we have the means to help improve mental health in our communities through our well-managed parks and natural areas. This is especially important during times of stress and crisis, and I would argue it's important all the time, particularly in this community. So briefly, back to kind of the budget guidelines that we were provided, some of which included, um, let's talk about our, your accomplishments from current and previous year in our case. Uh, as a citizen, what did my taxes or county revenue get used for at the county and office level? What services did we provide? What infrastructure was maintained or improved? What efforts were made to save money and what efficiencies were identified? And I'll kind of walk through several slides that hopefully will indicate those things. Uh, again, capital projects was another port, part of the budget guidelines this year. Uh, did you request funds? What is the status of those projects if you did? Uh, and we did. New positions funded, are they currently filled? If not, what's the status? Uh, Kathleen did talk about some of the positions we're asking for this year. We don't have any unfilled positions currently, but we are requesting three positions. Generally, an opportunity to provide you a quick tour. Very briefly, um, you know, often time folks feel, oh, you manage Barber Park and that's kind of what you do. Well, it is where our headquarters is and all those things. We, we kind of live there, work there uh, every day, but we do manage facilities countywide and are involved in partnerships countywide. That just indicates a map of, of most of those partnerships and properties we're involved with. Um, and generally speaking, just the location of those properties. If you've never driven from Barber Valley, say to Hubbard Reservoir, or driven from Barber Valley in Barber Park to the 80 Eagle Bike Park, which is where the landfill is located or near the landfill, um, you don't really understand, you know, it, it does take time to mobilize, deploy, and then manage those properties and facilities regularly. And we do that day in and day out. So let's start with Barber Park. We've had active management, the county, since 1970s. It's a 68-acre park property. It also is our headquarters, as I mentioned. A lot of people do generally like to talk about the green roof on the right and the solar tube roof on the left. Um, it's a LEED certified facility. And in the background, you can see the Barber Park Education and Event Center. A little bit of an overview map of uh, Barber Park with the trails listed there, just generally showing you um, a portion of that 68 acres, not the entirety. Uh, yes, the float season happens there, but year round, there's all kinds of things that happen in Barber Park. This is a, a listing and photos of some of those events that we support and help organize and host in Barber Park, in addition to just general public usage. So let's jump into the Boise River float season. So. The, the official opening of the season is announced by our department. We announced the opening of the season last week and the season opened on Tuesday. Uh, we did operate last year in the pandemic. Once again, um, meeting the challenge uh, provided by the community with the support of the Central District Health Department, uh, the Board of County Commissioners, the Mayor and others, we had a full season and it was a record-breaking season, most visitation in history. So we expect this season to once again uh, surpass that record we set last year. All those services provided are under our, um, our management. Uh, we do run a equipment rental and, and shuttle concession through a contractor, and then we run parking directly through the county, fee parking. So once again, that was a historic season last year. Uh, dates and details, we opened July 1st last year, a little bit later because of COVID and a lot of the kind of hoops and hurdles that we had to deal with. Closing date is always Labor Day. We had 61 total operational days, um, average river flow and, and average daily temp are just a couple of items. On the right, you see the photos of some of the changes that were implemented to continue to allow folks to participate in the activity while still being safe in terms of COVID. 
We do conduct quite a bit of social media outreach. We, we manage and administer and ha did create um, a few years back the Float the Boise River Facebook page. Last year's opening day post garnered um, a reach of about 64,498 people, over 11,000 engagements, 360 shares, 313 reactions, 191 comments. And then we did post for this opening day and that um, surpassed that by quite a bit. 99,000 people reached, 10,615 engagements, 774 shares, a lot of reactions, comments. Um, again, a lot of people reached in the last 28 day, days, and then our total page follows, um, is over, surpasses 10,000. That's one of a few pages we do manage. It's the most popular of the pages we manage. In terms of what that meant for revenue and what this float season brings in for revenue to Ada County, um, that equipment rental and shuttle contract um, generates a revenue share to the county. So there's a significant portion of gross revenue. The county has a, a, an agreement that provides a revenue share based on the volume of you know, equipment rented and vehicles or shuttles run. Uh, it, the shuttle contract for last season was $229,050 in, in revenue share for the county. It was 11.3% increase in daily gross over the 2019 season, which was the previous record high. What does that look like from a rental perspective? Just, I, I do this kind of year in and year out. I, I tend to want you to focus kind of on that right hand side, the italics and highlighted. Bottom line is we're, we're renting more pieces of equipment every year this is happening. There's, and, and we're adjusting, investing, making the con, helping the contractor to ensure that they invest in inventory to make everything more efficient, more buses, more equipment, just to make sure things are moving with the push in population. It's extremely challenging in the limited space we have to deal with this huge influx. But these were all record setting um, numbers last year, uh, with the exception of that more most four-person raft rentals in a day. There was one day where two more rafts were rented, and it was the Sunday of Labor Day in 2018 when that was the most four-person raft rentals. All other records were set this last season. We expect to set those again this season. It's always tricky because I mentioned, you know, we just started the this float season, which is in fiscal year 21. <laughs> two days ago or three days ago. And, you know, I set the target for what we anticipate for revenue uh, a full year prior to that for the upcoming year because of the way the fiscal year aligns with the float season. Much like Bob with the fair, you're, you're kind of targeting conservatively what you anticipate for revenue. And um, we generally, every year we surpass it uh, for the float season. Parking and shuttle, um, just an indication here of, of the increase in visitation and growth in the valley. Uh, gross revenue for parking last season was $191,345. Represented a 33% increase from 2019, but a port that can largely be attributed to the increase in, in fee parking that was recommended by last year's commission. Um, we increased that to $7 daily. Formerly it was $5 for weekdays and $6 for weekends and holidays. Now it's a $7 flat rate across the board. However, the total number of vehicles parked, um, again, 27,335 um, with a 516 daily average vehicles parked was a 28% increase from 2019. So we were more efficiently moving people through the park and onto the river. This year, I would expect uh, over 50,000 people to ride the shuttle, and I would expect over 30,000 people, given the duration of the season, maybe uh, 35,000 people to park in Barber Park for this float season. So it's going to surpass what we've ever uh, accommodated. I will mention here, if you look at the shuttle figure, the shuttle figure from last season, um, it related to COVID restrictions, the buses were not run at full capacity. Every other seat in that bottom right-hand corner you can see was blocked off by an empty box. And so shuttles were, again, a CDH guideline that was approved, were, were um, required to run at half capacity. Uh, they still were run frequently to pick up the floaters that were utilizing the shuttle. This season with full capacity shuttles, I expect, again, record-breaking um, shuttle riders. So there was a decrease last year, uh, but that was what that was related to. 
Now again, Barber Park has a Barber Park Education and Event Center. Some of you have been there and attended events there. Um, in fiscal year 2019, we've got to go back to the last full year, which was a 128 event day year. Event bookings generated $116,000, 116,260 in revenue, and then alcohol sales through our um, exclusive alcohol provider was 14,220. Now all events were canceled due to COVID from March 16th to 20, 20, 2020 to just this last April. So we kind of had a bit of a half year. We had the beginning half of fiscal year 20, we had events. And during that time, we were able to uh, accommodate 60 event days, um, generated $67,391 in event bookings and $8,220 in alcohol sales. Now in fiscal year 21, which we're currently in, we're getting a second half sort of, you know, after um, that it, we started events again May 1. So we're kind of two different years are coming together to kind of create a full year of revenue for the event center. What does the event center host? Any meeting, any activity, any event that you can name, we've hosted it there. Um, we provide all services from site visits, tours, to contracting, to showings, to prepare, preparing the documents that you'll see um, on your open business meeting agendas, to then staffing those with our event attendant for every event, setting up all furnishings, cleaning up furnishings, meeting tables and chairs we provide, pipe and drape, and then cleaning that all up, turning it over for the next event. Okay, so let's talk a little bit. I know I'm kind of jumping through Barber Park quite a bit here. Barber Park plan areas, and this will relate a little bit more to the capital um, supplemental, I guess we should, we should call it. This year, this current fiscal year, we, um, we utilize our fund balance per last year's budget to complete a huge, tremendous project in areas one, two, three, and four on this graphic. And then we're asking for um, funding, usage of fund balance to complete areas five and six. So let's talk a little bit about what primarily that this project did this year. And we're gonna focus just on the plaza. So this was plan area three before we tackled the project. Um, misaligned pathways, no ADA accessibility to restrooms, no ADA picnic pads, um, really uh, bad condition in terms of the organization of the park and how this was routed, it was unsafe. Um, this was the concept, uh, and I'll get a little bit through this, but we had to remove all asphalt pathways, modify the alignments, install ADA compliant pathways. A lot of what we did is underground, a brand new slam bang irrigation system, all new landscaping in these areas. Numerous swales, in, or uh, installation of a swale in the mud bog. We created a flood mitigation berm and shaping in the, um, near the northern portion of the plaza. And we called, installed seat wall resting benches. So. Again, this was kind of the concept. And as of last Friday, one week ago today, it's been a bit of a busy week, we pulled the ribbon um, on all new construction and allowed the public access into the area for the first time starting on Friday evening, Saturday morning. A reminder of what those pathways look like prior to, this is kind of some examples of what we were dealing with and what we were attempting to fix in Barber Park. It was pretty horrid. <laughs> And so I'm just going to flip through several construction photos of the work being done over the last several months. It's really stressful to be living, working in a construction environment for months on end and also knowing you have a timeline to get this park ready for a few, couple hundred thousand visitors. So again, just flipping through what that construction zone looked like throughout the last couple of months during construction requisite selfie picture in there. <laughs> um, so this is kind of a, a sort of early construction of one portion of the project during construction once again, and then kind of what it looks like now. So that's a, a connecting path that never connected to the, to the public restrooms. There's an ADA picnic pad to the right of that you just can't see. Um, and then one in the background there that you can see. You can see a seat wall bench in the background as well. Again, a sort of early construction um, during construction, more during construction. This is where your capital dollars go when you give them to us. We make things nicer, better, easier, safer. And that's what we're looking like today. 
night and day. So just another photo kind of you, this is those areas where you saw those old asphalt pathways. This is what we're dealing with in the new plaza now. It's really cool to see people using it. So please come on out, looking forward to when you can come see it firsthand. <laughs> Again, capital, more capital projects that we do. We do manage, Kathleen mentioned, about 12 miles of the green belt. We've been doing that for quite some time. Uh, we inherited similar asphalt um, when I started here, and we've fixed a lot since I started here, too. So uh, we had had, you know, CIP projects, major funding, and we completed that one on the bottom right during the pandemic as well, the very beginning of the pandemic um, from April to May of 2020. Uh, but that's what our pathways look like when we get done with them. Kind of before and afters that we were dealing with there. This was the penitentiary canal project we undertook. This was the Expo Idaho. The buffs are the before, the belows are the after of the same location. Jumping right into Lucky Peak Lake. It's hard to go through all these properties this quickly, but um, I appreciate your patience. There are 16 recreation sites, designated recreation sites on the lake, as well as four designated uh, boat ramp access areas. The surface properties are primarily managed by the Army Corps of Engineers. The state parks uh, portion, which is just Spring Shores and the marina, is managed by Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation. And then Ada County manages every dock facility on the lake, including those at the boat ramps. So where the land meets the dock, the dock is our responsibility, um, including that transition ramps. That right-hand side depicts the signage that you'll find. Um, we now have our logo also integrated into these signs um, in most cases, but it does say docks provided by Ada County Parks and Waterways under agreement with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. That center is the photo that hopefully you will all be participating in um, during our site visit and tour and partnership meeting at Lucky Peak toward the end of July. Um, Commissioner Kenyon is pictured there along with the former director of uh, state parks uh, David Langhorst and Parks staff from the state, from our department, and also from um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Ada County Sheriff. Ada Eagle Bike Park, another facility um, contiguous with the landfill, but designated and carved off for recreation. Uh, if you haven't been there, I'd love to um, take you on a site visit there with some of our staff. Uh, probably our um, beyond, behind um, Barber Park, the Greenbelt, and you know Lucky Peak obviously gets a lot of interaction. This is one of the busiest facilities that we do have management responsibility for. It's in partnership with the City of Eagle, but Ada County owns the majority of that property and manages the majority of trail mileage. These aren't your typical you know, foothills trails. A lot of them are purpose-built trails, mountain bike specific. Some are downhill only mountain bike trails. People come from all over the Western United States to come to this bike park. You may not know that. It's part of the reason why um, this area was designated as a, uh, a gold standard by the National Mountain Biking Association. Um, they referenced specifically this bike park in that designation. Just some photos of our trail crew management team working with volunteers and also um, performing maintenance on, on trails. Oregon Trail Recreation Area, the county owns um, about 14, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 25 acres of the trailhead um, is county property and then it abuts uh, BLM property. We manage this in conjunction with BLM, but um, the toehold of the park is where we have the, the trailhead, the signage, the wagon theme, um, a lot of interpretive and historic signage. We did install a public restroom there last year. Uh, vault toilet there so we have pretty much all the amenities you would expect from kind of a world-class trailhead or a local trailhead that most people come to expect victory wetlands is kind of a pocket park that we collaborate with achd a lot of uh, information education outreach related to water quality uh, the boise river watershed um, and those kinds of items habitat Hubbard Reservoir Recreation Area, our department manages through a lease agreement with the Idaho Department of Lands. It's 377 uh, acres of open space with trails. We do have a parking lot, trailhead, multi-use trails, kiosk, and a restroom that we installed in 2014. Down near CUNA, um, in that location, most people have no idea where this is. If you want to know, I can tell you. <laughs> it's head on Eagle Road South, and then when the road kind of dead ends, you 
take a left and a right, and you'll find your way. All right, so that was kind of a lot, I understand. We do utilize plans to support um, our goals, objectives, and priorities. We reference these plans. Um, some quotes from those plans include, the county may expend funds to maintain or improve existing agricultural lands and open spaces. This could take the form of upkeep, such as mowing and maintenance, which we of course do, or developing open spaces to support recreational activities, which we have also done. Uh, quote again, the full carrying, capacity, carrying costs of the land, i.e. maintenance and upkeep, are also the full responsibility of the county. Recommendations included in some of these plans are to acquire more land for open space recreation facilities and trails to maintain the existing parks, open spaces, uh, and trails. Expand or renovate existing parks, open space areas, and trails, including the replacement and or improvement of existing facilities. And then of course to develop new parks, facilities, and trails, um, assuming that acquisition has occurred. All right, so this brings us to the numbers. Um, Kathleen hit on these already. Parks, our operating budget request for fiscal year 22 is uh, $1,452,204. $2, uh, the personnel budget request is $788,888. The total budget request you see there includes a 650K fund balance usage request, which is in the supplemental. The waterways, uh, just to Reiterate with Kathleen mentioned, we're, we're um, requesting movement of a, our waterways, single waterway staff member under the parks umbrella, which allows for a little bit more um, growth and development um, and progression uh, within the, the parks umbrella. Just to highlight those supplemental requests, one, we have uh, the PBS supplemental for those three new positions, waterways maintenance supervisor, trail crew maintenance leader, and program and education specialist, totaling $178,293. And then we have a supplemental request number one, which is a one-time fund balance usage to complete areas five and six, which includes the bridges, forest loop, and fishing pier. And I'll show a photo of that in a moment. And supplementary request number two would be for temporary payroll for seasonal staffing needs in parks, greenbelt trails, and all trails divisions. And that represents, the number is not there, that represents a $30,000 increase. Going back to areas five and six of Barber Park, that's those areas you see there. This is the forested loop, this is that 650K would replace the bridges. We have the same asphalt in this location as we had in the other portions of the park. Um, we are not looking to do concrete here. It's more of a natural area. We're evaluating several different alternatives that are more suitable for natural areas that are also um, conducive to maintenance, but aren't kind of counter to what you would expect in a natural area. And then a fishing pier on the upper left-hand side, we had to um, remove a fishing pier post-flood 2017 due to damage. Just a bit uh, of information. We do already have the design approval um, of uh, design completed, engineering completed. Um, much of the permitting is in place. Uh, and we do have some uh, cost projections, of course, for the budget related to this project, including that's a design drawing of the fishing pier. Then the other supplemental request is for the waterways division. And there's a few familiar faces there uh, on the boat for which we are requesting fund balance usage for a grant match to purchase um, replacement motors for the, the Almar Center Console, Center Console workboat in the amount of $16,000. The total grant request um, amount would be $50,000. We've talked with Idaho State Parks. It's the best way to kind of do this. They do encourage us to apply for the grant funding. It's, it's a cost-effective way to continue to utilize that boat. Um, that, that was designed and fabricated for the department. Um, so that's that. That's all I have for you today. Happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Scott. Are there any questions from the commissioners? Yeah, Scott, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what percentage are you estimating to that you're going to need out of the general tax fund versus the revenues and fees that you'll be bringing in? Uh, Commissioner Beck, uh, sorry, Chairman Beck, Commissioner Kenyon. Um, the percentage this year, I am not certain. Does Kathleen have that no, figure for me? No. 
Um, generally speaking, with you know, with how our funding works, is we do uh, bring in um, when we're not requesting usage of fund balance. I mean, if we're using 650k of fund balance, that is revenue we did generate. Mm -hmm. So this year, it's going to be a significant portion of our total budget. Can't do the math while I'm standing up you in front of you. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I'd be happy to get that for you. Yeah, sure. But when we're requesting usage of that, it's not an it's not an ongoing expense. What it is is money we've generated at Barber Park over the years, and it has accumulated to the point where now we have enough to replace failing infrastructure. So um, this is a year in which quite a bit of our budget is related to revenue if we are supported with that fund balance usage. Just wanted to point out to the public what a great job you guys do in generating your own revenues and it's not you know 100% uh, needed uh, from taxpayer dollars to support what you do. So that would be great for us to maybe highlight on Monday. And then what was the bump in 2000 or yeah 2018 when the budget was so much higher? Sure thing. So um, Chairman Beck and Commissioner Kenyon, um, first off, that first part of it, I do want to emphasize the first question you, you were addressing. Yes, we leverage taxpayer dollars. That's one of the biggest things we do. We leverage taxpayer dollars with dollars from outside of the county. People that visit are often coming from outside of Ada County, coming from outside of the state. We love that message. We'll get you the percentage. Secondly, in 2018, that huge bump, um, we had a public hearing in this room. There was quite a bit of discussion, but, but the bottom line was uh, it was an increase uh, in general fund support to replace the penitentiary canal green belt. It was a oh, green belt, a huge okay. uh, green belt construction project for that single year. Yeah, I remember that now. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Uh, do you have any questions, Commissioner uh, Davidson? Has there ever <clears throat> been any discussions about whether or not the county should continue to operate the Barber Park Event Center? You know, is it uh, bringing enough revenue in? Are we unnecessarily competing with the private sector? Is it just something that we want to continue to do? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Davidson, in my tenure, there has not been discussion related to that. Um, my understanding is there may have been some discussion, you know, nine, 10 years ago. However, the facility has only been there since 2006, uh, open to the public since then. Um, I think it does provide a tremendous resource to the community. It's, it's frequently used, as I mentioned, 128, 130 days a year. Um, we get usage out of that. It does generate revenue. Um, it is a really nice way to showcase what the county does provide. Uh, the price point tends to be lower than your private facilities as a public resource and asset in a public park. But um, I think we do, with what we've been given to manage, um, and what is on our plate to manage, I really think we do a tremendous uh, job for 80 county taxpayers and citizens and visitors with including the event center with everything we're tasked with managing. Thank you. Sure. I don't have any questions. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Thanks for all the hard work you do. Uh, I know the citizens of Ada County appreciate the, the services that are offered and they love the, the float season and all the rest. So I want to thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, seeing your Lucky Peak uh, project. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right, last budget presentation. Got some more presentations, but this is the last one for the budgets. Bob Batista has been the director of Expo Idaho for 22 years. Expo is an enterprise fund and receives no tax support and consists of two departments, fair and interim events. Expo Idaho is located on the northwest corner of Shinden and Glenwood. The campus footprint consists of 240 acres that encompasses the 80,000 square foot expo building and several smaller buildings and barns. There's a grand there is grandstand seating for 4,000 people, 4,500 spaces for vehicles to park, and a 220 slip RV park next to Boise River. 2022 is the 125th year of the annual Western Idaho Fair, which starts the third Friday in August each year. The Western Idaho Fair promotes the Treasure Valley's heritage to agriculture, takes pride in being a role model for our community education, and celebrates all that Ada County has to offer. This only takes place 
in 10 days with the attendance of approximately 250,000 people, making it the state's largest event. Interim events are activities, shows, and gatherings that occur the remainder of the year when the Western Idaho Fair is not in, process, in progress. There are approximately 150 interim events each year, equating to 620 event days per year. Some of the events include the Sportsman Show, Roadster Show, Flea Market, Ski Swap, Home and Garden Shows, Health Fair, Dog and Cat Shows, Weddings, the Boise uh, Music Festival, and every five years, High Aldi. Expo Idaho is a self-supported uh, fund. They are an enterprise fund. The budget for FY22 is submitted at $8,410,279, an increase of $334,379 over the prior uh, adopted budget in FY21. You can see the budget to actual information below and the number of employees remaining consistent um, with a reduction this year. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Bob who will pre Bob Batista, who will present uh, the Western Idaho Fair budget. <clears throat> Thank you, Kathleen. Will you show me how to move the slides here? You bet. I finally put in that. So just... Click that button. OK. Welcome you, to our house, Bob. What's that? Welcome to our house. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to give you our presentation. This is 22 years of doing this. I still feel like I'm going to the principal's office and get a little nervous, but um, that's just kind of the way it goes here. <laughs> yeah, these things are never easy because they are very important to how the county operates and, and everybody's particular budget. Um, I'm gonna switch glasses because I'm getting old as well and I need to see. Um, I can relate. So, the first slide we have here is our office overview. And Kathleen kind of went through some of the missions that we have, although she didn't say the 125th centennial year, which is a tough one to pronounce, and I'll try and do it later on in my presentation. But the mission for Expo Idaho is to be a self-sustaining, multi-purpose, year-round venue that hosts events, fostering community, business, agriculture, and entertainment in the Treasure Valley. The Western Idaho Fair is to bring the citizens of Eddy County and the Treasure Valley through Idaho communi communi community educational, agricultural education, excuse me, competitions for youth and adult ed, uh, development, entertainment, demonstrations, and participating in Idaho's largest event. Our core values are community oriented, quality service, production, integrity, competent staff, and fiscal responsibility. Anybody recognize that photo? <laughs> 1967 was when the fairgrounds officially kind of got all of its parts and pieces together. That's quite a shot there that leads you to, to know that we've, quite, we've gone quite a way in what we really have done here in Boise and it's continuing with the growth here that really is going to impact how we do business out here. The next slide is just a couple of comments. Expo Idaho is a valued community property that serves the citizens of Ada County in times of prosperity and despair. We just went through the despair with the COVID and we're gonna talk about some of the things that we um, did that I think was very beneficial to the community. We also come together to share in these commonalities to carry a message of the community as we move forward. The cultural heritage here at, Agricult uh, at Expo Idaho since its opening in 1967 is what sets us apart and we cannot lose the sight of the impact this asset has on our community. In 2022, the Western Idaho Fair's Quiz Quai Centennial, if I got that right, is 125 years. We have been in business for 125 years doing a fair. So that in itself says something to me about how the community and this, this uh, uh, this uh, county embraces the fair. Anybody recognize that? That's current. To go from pretty much a desert little place to all of a sudden the facility is green, it's taken care of, it's managed well. Um, I think this uh, bodes well for what we do and what we provide for the citizens of Ada County. Our long-term goals and objectives for Expo Idaho is to be a self-sustaining facility, 
to host a minimum of 150 events per year, utilizing the variety of, of the facilities and grounds amenities, to have a 90% minimum occupancy annually at the Boise River Park, and currently right now it's running way beyond 100%, um, to provide citizens of uh, Ada County citizens with a quality operation that supports year-round multi-purpose facilities. That's for Expo Idaho. The long-term and goals of Jackson for the Western Night Fair to continue to be a self-sustaining event that has a minimum of 3,000 competitors and 15,000 exhibits each year. This comes from the community. We'd like to provide agricultural education of the Greater Treasure Valley to maintain an annual attendance or increase of 250,000 people, provide community program for youth and adult development, and ensure the citizens of Ada County are given the opportunity to celebrate their community fair each year uh, at the end of the year summer event. Our matrix for success to ensure our long-term and repeat customers increase facility use for those events that happen only once, such as weddings, quinceaneras. We have a pretty standard base of clientele that come out here but there's always those one-offs that we gotta to continue to pursue. We wanna to continue to maintain the RV park facility at 90%. We want to grow the Western Idaho Fair attendance by 3%. We'd like to increase the 1.2 million footprints that attend, use, participate, or walk through the Expo Idaho grounds each year. So we take into consideration events that it probably is about 750,000. Our, our promoters do not give us the numbers, but over the years we've been able to kind of get a general idea. We take into the Hawks games, we take into consider the baseball games that are taking place out in uh, Lady Bird Park. We take into consideration the fair number, and then we take into consideration the people that walk the green belt through there. And so we really believe that we have about a million two people that touch our fairgrounds and Expo Idaho each year. Now I'm gonna go out on a limb here a little bit and be a little bold. And I'm asking for a 3% increase in staff wages for our staff on top of the ones that the county will grant. This hospitality industry that we're in took a terrible hit. It's been a very rough year. As you can see, everybody trying to get out of that, you can't find any help. The help issue is really tough. And so I'd like to propose this on top of that because when we went through the pandemic, we did not let anybody go, nobody in the county got laid off. We managed to try and do everything we could to try and keep our entity afloat. People took time off for holidays, time off for vacation, wherever they could to try and help us get through this. Not only that, but this has been a tough time to be a leader. It's been really hard for me to prop up a team and keep them going when there's not a lot of business. And when the business is, it's up and down and then people got COVID. So everybody's faced this trouble. But as our industry comes back, we're the first ones out and we're gonna be the last ones in and we're seeing the difficulties of getting people ready to go. Most of my staff right now, as we try and fill positions, uh, we're working six days a week just to try and get up. And what's, what's happened is, is everybody that had a quinceanera, a wedding or a family reunion, they were all shut out, they're coming to us. So normally this summer we're getting ready for fair. We're not only getting ready for fair, we're doing events and we've got a summer concert series. And so at this point, um, I just would like to sit there and throw that out there that I think our staff has done a great job. I know everybody in the county has some same issues, but we were probably hit the hardest and in particular as an enterprise fund, we had to run like a business. And so with that said, I'll leave that alone. The accomplishments for 2021 Expo Idaho is a self-supporting enterprise. Our revenues are used to operate our facilities and reinvest in, in improvements and maintaining of the Expo Idaho grounds. As an enterprise fund, we always encourage staff to find efficient and effective ways to maintain Expo Idaho and the surrounding amenities that will help keep costs down and revenue up. Over the past year, five years, we were making repairs to the Expo Idaho roof. The way this started out was we were going to do the expo roof and we didn't quite have enough funds in our account as an enterprise fund. When we get enough money, we keep it over in fund balance and then we get to a point we use that to fix and do capital projects. So we started out with the expo roof at first. We didn't have enough cash in, the, in, our, in our account in the fund balance. So we went to the small animal barn or the premium building. We did that roof first. 
We had a little enough extra money that we purchased the materials in that same year for the next year where we did the large animal barn. And then um, two years ago, we were gonna try and get the expo done. That didn't happen. And so um, we're requesting to get the roof replaced. This capital project was at 1.5 million and talking with Mr. Crisco, um, materials and labor and everything have gone up. We believe that we've had to add another $250,000 in order to get that at least reasonably up where we think this could land. Mr. Chair. Yes. Are you saying so now it's at 1.7? We believe that's true, uh, Commissioner Kenyon, um, just based on the cost of materials and labor and everything else. Okay. okay. Uh, one of the other things of our accomplishments is during the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to provide small groups with large space to gather while abiding by CDH guidelines. Here's a couple of, not a couple, here's a list of accomplishments for the 2020-21 that we did in, in, uh, in helping through uh, the time of COVID. Uh, we did do a 4-H and FFA sale, which was for the fair um, last year. We provided space for United Way that came down and put together care boxes for some 4,000 homeless high school kids. It's hard to believe in this community we have 4,000 homeless high school kids that needed some basics, toothpaste, brushes, uh, whatever they did and they needed, we helped them do that. We provided, we helped with this, the food bank delivering food baskets out there for people in need of uh, food sub, uh, substance. We did the Thanksgiving basket where people in, during Thanksgiving were able to get uh, some food for their families, mass distribution. We did the COVID drive through site for those folks that needed to have that. We were hand sanitizing storage. We did the Ada County courts. We did a bunch of training for the MTs and sheriffs and fire. Christmas in Color was the drive through uh, Christmas show that you had on the West parking lot. Um, we've done UPS storage. We have had a parking for tree company that's been working out there. We had some bird watching and we had some hot air balloons. Not all of these made money, but they certainly helped the community in getting through this pandemic. Our total expense budget, uh, personnel um, with department 80 and 82. Department 80 is the fair. Uh, 873,000 is for the fair, and that includes 65,000 that we pay the sheriffs for their support out there at the fair. The operating is 5,336,000, capital is 1.792. As you can see, 1.75 will be used for the capital roof repair. The personnel has decreased, we have dropped a position and our capital uh, and operating is increased $350,000 due primarily, as I'm gonna talk a little bit farther into the expenses, labor, security costs. We put some extra money in professional services in there so that we could, if we needed to get down the road of, of what the Citizens Advisory Group and everything had, we could certainly work through that. Um, but we're also seeing jumps in food costs and alcohol costs and paper products. Our whole budget as a private, as an enterprise fund, all that impacts on how we do business. You can see on this sign here, uh, slide here, that we've broken this down into capital, operating, and personnel. You can see from the personnel that we have dropped that one position from 2021 uh, in the operating side. You can see that we're up. And again, I, I referred to all of the costs that are going up. Uh, you can't go out and eat dinner anymore or have a lunch anymore with everything not being at least $5 or more. Um, and then the capital, again, we reduced it a little bit because um, we just don't know if we're gonna have enough money at the end of this to try and do a whole bunch of other things other than try and look after the roof. <clears throat> As you can see in the um, Capital there, that little small portion that's capital, that was when we did the doors for the Expo Idaho in 2019, which was a great addition. Budgeted revenues, um, you can see in the far right hand side, the actual um, 1.6, 1.5 was through our interim 
And you can see that the fare generated 143,000. Now, if you take a look in 2021, the fare is typically a $4 million project. Uh, and this current year, it's a 4.5 on the fare with a total between the two at 6.6 .6 million. So you can see how the um, COVID-19 impacted us tremendously. And the revenues that are gonna be increased on here are primarily gonna be coming from uh, ticket prices for carnival, ticket prices for some of our admission. And on the interim side, we had a meeting at the fair board where we're talking about increasing the rental rates. Those haven't been increased in five years. Power's going up, trash hauling's going up, all of that's going up. So we're looking to make those adjustments as we, through this budget. Our supplemental request, uh, it still is to go get the roof fixed. I mean, that is the workhorse of our, of our property in the off season. Um, we're going to use fund balance to take care of the cost of approximately 1.75. Uh, if we don't get the repairs repaired, it will delay, could cause some unsafe public, cause some significant damage to the Ada County asset. The other thing is the, th the citizen advisory uh, scenario has included the expo as a, as a preserved stu structure in all three different properties. The other thing we'd like to do, um, and we have it budgeted, and it certainly will depend on how this year works out with our money that we get into our fund balance. We'd certainly like to try and do something with those stalls that the horse racing had and get those knocked down and get some seed in the ground and kind of get it beautificationed up. It's, it's not really a public nuisance, but it potentially could be a public nuisance. And so we really need to try and get that taken care of. To give you an idea how we're doing as we're going into this particular fair, we pulled up some numbers today and we've shared some of the numbers with you before, but this is kind of a, an, over, an overview of what this community is, is, is needing for entertainment, socialization, mental health, all that. In the ticket sales in 2019, on June 18th, we had 200 tickets sold. That's kind of when we started. As of today, June 18th in 2021, we have 6,327 tickets sold. So there's a demand for people wanting to get out, a demand for people that want to interact with people. I think it's good for their mental health, as like Scott referred to, getting out. And as I've said before, with the coming fair, we are creating as much space as we can for people to be able to at least feel comfortable within their space and people around them. So thank you. There's a few slides of all the things we kind of do out there. Um, and I will entertain questions. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I, uh... I think that we have a valuable asset there in the Expo Idaho property. I'm wondering if you could contact the uh, Idaho Transportation Department and get them to change the sign on the freeway where they say fairgrounds to Expo. Oh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, sir. <laughs> yep, make a note of that. We call it Expo, but anybody coming here looks at it and says, well, it's fairgrounds. So. They'll still get there, but we do need to correct yes. them. <laughs> I know they'll get there. I know we still they'll need get to get our, 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 what we really are calling ourselves, and we have been for quite some time. That's right. We want to, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, anyway, I don't have any other questions. I'm happy we're, uh, we're all set for a fantastic fair. I think it's going to be a record season for, uh, for, for you and for the, for the community. Uh, I think people are, are excited, and they're anxious, and they're extremely pleased that we're having the fair and that we're getting full – I guess you've got a really good lineup of some of the entertainers and so forth. And I think people are looking forward to uh, spending time at the fair and at the expo property. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're doing that. Well, if it's, any, if it's in a reflection on the ticket sales, yes, it yes. is. Yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yes. Do we have questions from the commissioners? I just have uh, a couple, Mr. Chair. So I think you might uh, take the, um, the title of the Swiss Army Knife away from Phil's office because this year you guys were everything to everybody it seemed like <laughs> well you, I've that. always taken the philosophy that you know we're an enterprise fund and we're there to, to serve and make some money for you guys or the county in itself but we're also a resource that we need to take care of and like I said in times of prosperity and times of despair 
You know, we, I remember back in the days when we were considered a civil defense spot, you know, that's an old, <laughs> yeah. that's an old call when the, when the, when the world was under the trouble, when you had the sirens going off, you ran to the building that was there. So we also serve as a, as a central district health for various issues just like this. We got a lot of bunch of little side agreements that we really do work with the community and don't charge them anything to make sure that they're taken care of because they will take care of us once everybody's healthy and come down and see our events. It truly is a community gathering place. Yeah. So what's your fund balance going to look like um, if we approve the 1.7 for the roof? What it, would be left? It, uh, it will be, well, it's kind of hard to say because our fund balance right now is a little over 3 million. I think it's about 3.1, Kathleen. Yeah. So after you, yeah, it kind of depends on what your revenue is going to be. Yeah, so in. Sure, when I, I say that, what the fund, fund balance is, it right? The fund three, balance okay. over three million. We've we've yeah. we've gone down about a million dollars, but as you can see, we're moving back up in that area. And you looked at that one slide on the interim where we our interim carried us through this, and that was through courts. I got to thank Sandra on that. Yeah. Um, I just but, didn't want to leave. But I think if we get through the fair this year and we see what kind of money I have, because that's the following year, I think we're going to be more than more than capable of taking on this this yeah, expense. Revenue should be up. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. How, how did uh, all the longtime vendors of the fair do over the last year? Did any go bankrupt, or have they all kind of survived and come back? Um, in the case of most of the promoters, they're still coming back. We're starting to get a lot of bookings on top of those. And as far as the vendors during fair, uh, the food vendors, we've had not, everybody's still coming back. Um, the best part about that is that's a good revenue stream for a lot of them. Well, I know we they had a hard time not being able to do the fair last time. So, so we did some things that we we're trying to help them. Um, normally, what they do when they come in is they have to pay a deposit, and that deposit really works against their rent or what they gross is. As we they, we take twenty percent. That's common in the industry. Um, and so, um, when they pay that rent, um, that's how we normally do it. But this year, we've waived the deposit so that those folks don't have to exert, um, put some money out in advance to get their spot located. It all works against when the 20% that they pay us. So we get a deposit, we apply that to whatever their gross is, and then we take the 20%. So this year we've tried to help them out by not taking that deposit and initially giving them a little bit of a fresh start and a little extra money to get going. Great. Yeah, well, since you know their losses last time was so you know, connected to COVID, I'm hoping we can take a look at some of this supplemental money we have coming in to make it a little easier for you guys out there. But thanks for all your service. It's uh, such a great asset we have out there, and we're we're all looking forward to the to the future. Thank you very much, commissioners. I appreciate it. If there's no other questions, uh, I I appreciate and support all your leadership. It really does help us out there when we get get into tough situations. So well, thank, thank you again. Well, appreciate thanks, it. Bob. And I, I do believe that uh, some of this Biden bucks that's coming into town, we may be able to use for some of the facilities at, at, at Expo uh, that might help with your uh, with your fund balance. And again, I just want to thank you again for the, the service you offer this community. And we should all remember that uh, the Expo Idaho property is a diamond in the rough, and we're going to try and clean, make it even shine, shinier, polish it, and make it a great, an, another, a, a better asset than it is already. It's a great asset, but it's a good community uh, center, and I think we can really polish it up and make it even better. And I, I can't more agree wholeheartedly. There's plenty of room out there to do a lot of things. And I think that, you know, once we get through a few steps we're going to go through, we'll have a good idea where we can go. And then then the work really starts on how we're going to get it all Absolutely. Going. Absolutely. So, but uh, thanks for your service. My pleasure, commissioners. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And that's for you, right? Kathleen. Yes, so next on the agenda, we were going to have a presentation on um, the capital improvement program. If I can get my mouse to work here. So let's close this down. And I will bring this up, and I believe Richard Beck is going to present this for you. Welcome again, Richard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. So, uh, this, this week you've uh, heard directly from departments and offices about their needs for proposed capital um, and extraordinary operational expense projects um, that call for use of general funds. I'm going to attempt to uh, 
uh, bring them all together in a brief overview of the FY22 capital investment program and highlight the uh, priority recommendations of the Ada County Transformation Board. So as an overview, this year the Transformation Board considered four capital projects that call for just over four and a half million dollars and eight extraordinary operational expense or EOE projects that call for just over $2.7 million. The, the funding that would be required to fund all of the submitted projects would be $7,271,902. This table that's, that's presently on the screen depicts the Transformation Board's recommended priority order for the proposed capital projects that call for the use of general funds. Uh, priority one is a project to install cameras in cell blocks seven and eight in the 80 County Jail submitted by the Sheriff's Office. Number two is access control and security system upgrades for the elections in the Benjamin Lane campus submitted by the Clerk's Office. Number three is access and control and security system upgrades for jail two in the courthouse. Uh, submitted by the Sheriff's Office, and number four is a remodel of the uh, Drug and Problem Solving Court Treatment Center submitted by the Trial Court Administration Office. Um, $4,562,700 would be required to fund all of these uh, important and urgent projects. And then, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, uh, this table that's now on the screen depicts the Transformation Board's recommendations or I should say recommended priority order for all of the proposed EOE projects call for use of general funds. The Transformation Board prioritized four of the submitted projects as important and urgent, identified in red on, on, in the chart. Uh, priority one is a project to replace the IBM i7 server and mainframe submitted by IT department. Number two is funding to allow for the adjustment of voting precincts and the acquisition of needed equipment in response to legislative reapportionment submitted by the clerk's office. And number three is an upgrade of the Pine Data Center Storage Area Network submitted by the Sheriff's Office. And number four is an upgrade of the Enterprise Jail Platform submitted by the Sheriff's Office. And for those projects, $1,960,202 would be required to fund them, them all. And there are also, uh, continuing on that table, there's four um, EOE projects that were prioritized by the Transformation Board as important, but non-urgent, as can be seen in yellow in the table. They include the proposals for a dispatch control system in the courthouse, a jail, in, jail inmate tracking system, a backup generator at Weed and Pest, and a key management system at the jail. And to clarify in this group, there are um, two Two projects which were submitted as part of the, the program but removed from uh, at the Transformation Board level. Number seven in the table will be re resubmitted later um, at a future date. And I believe for number 10, the clerk has identified a potential alternate means to fund that, that need. Yeah. So these important projects would call for an additional $749,000 uh, to fund. Uh, this table represents the combined priority recommendation for all CIP and EOE projects considered in FY22. And Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the Ada County Transformation Board recommends that you consider funding as many of the important and urgent projects identified in red as may be fiscally uh, feasible. And again, just to, to summarize, uh, the amount that, that would be required to fund all the important urgent projects, again, is $6,522,902. And then uh, to mention that $749,000 more would allow all projects uh, as submitted to be funded. And that is my quick, quick overview and summary. That's all I have. Is there other questions from the board? No, I think more just a question maybe directed towards Phil on number four on the problem solving court sure, treatment what's center. That? What's that? I, just Richard, do you mind flipping back to the sure. Just um, so we have scheduled some time next week to discuss the potential funding sources for that yeah. um, ahead of we'll, making decisions. We'll, I think we'll discuss that at the beginning on Monday, right, when we have that. And I'll say it at the moment just to kind of tee it up. My recommendation would, 
uh, likely be that we don't fund it through the budget, we'll discuss those potential alternate funds and how we would be able to use those for that purpose. And we'll be doing that in executive session because it's involved in litigation, correct? Okay. Are there any other questions? That's all I have. Do you have any Thank questions, you, uh, Commissioner? So for, for number three, the courthouse access control security systems upgrades, that's, is that in the basement jail? Holding facility, whatever you want to call it. And, Your chair and Commissioner Davis, and that's correct. Yeah, jail number two in the basement. So, so what are the upgrades? What's the, the status of the security down there now? Is and why is it so urgent? Mr. Chairman, let me pull up their their business case here real quick. Which one are you talking about, Commissioner? Number three, um, oh. access control and security system upgrade. I think this is the ongoing, right, to make sure that everything continues to get on the same system. So, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, uh, the, the information um, in our report to the Transformation Board indicates that the, the scope of the project includes upgrading old analog cameras, um, that replace those. They, they have new software that they're going to install, as well as new cell door um, controls and video retention capabilities. So, it sounds like a an upgrade in some of those older technologies is what they're after. I, I get the upgrade, but I maybe don't understand the prioritization. I mean, if we can still record on analog. Bruce we'll is right behind you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> is this on J2 in the basement? Yeah. 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 Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, yes. um, the importance of J2 upgrade, uh, it's the last piece in our entire county suite of security systems that are still on circuit boards. We cannot get parts to keep those circuit boards running anymore. Um, we have some old ones we salvaged when we did the security upgrade for the rest of the courthouse, so we do have some on the shelf, but um, it's inherently a weak system. We want to bring that up to the same security system that they have at the jail, the same security system we are currently installing at the uh, juvenile facility so that we have continuity across the county for all of our detention areas. Additionally, the camera interface will be through Genetech and interface with the new control center that we're uh, constructing currently uh, on the fourth floor for the Ada County Sheriff's Office. So the prioritization is more to if the old system breaks down, we don't have the- We don't have a remedy to keep it going once we run out of circuit boards. Okay. And that was a problem here initially, which was the impetus for us to upgrade the security system here at the courthouse, because we could only have 80 secure doors. We were limited on the amount of uh, controlled access doors we could have on the system. With Genetech, there's no limit. It's all web-based uh, security software. Very robust, very easy to use. So if it broke down, that, that would affect, that like would we be wouldn't bad. be able to record. Uh, it would be uh, the inability to control locked doors and uh, access. Um, it would be very problematic. Okay. We're trying to stay ahead of that so we don't get into that situation where we even have to entertain that scenario. <clears throat> and then uh, was maybe this is for Phil. I, th I think I asked about what, what's the reapportionment um, charge for Thank you, Bruce. Bruce. Uh, Commissioner Davidson, you'll remember this is the 50 precincts. So it's for the mapping, basically. No, no. no. This, this is for the equipment. Oh, for the this equipment. is for the scanners, the okay. assistive voting devices, and e electronic poll books. Uh, once you drew those precincts, you have to equip them. But we haven't drawn them yet. We're not sure if they're going to be 50 precincts. And No, this, but this is for uh, 50 okay. of them. All right, thank you. And I'll say in, in our budget is other expenses that are really like staffing and other things, but that was already built into our budget that we just discussed. Okay. So we usually have a brief presentation to uh, give an update on that facility plan. I'll stop touching that. Yes. We're not going to have that this year. No, we are. Okay. It's still scheduled. It's just we have lunch. We have a, another meeting scheduled, so we'll do it immediately. Uh, when we resume the oh, days yeah okay. the, it's I mean, we could do it now i don't know if jess wants to do it in the next How six minutes it's jeff? up to jess so i guess we could do it now yeah, yeah. Uh, we well. were trying to just balance between the various means. is that the next step or the continuation of the dev services uh, i think next would be it would be wise to do the master facility plan it ties in with the uh, cip and other stuff 
Okay. Please do it. Okay. Yep. Let's go with that. All right. Yeah, we had that plan too. Uh, I can't find my mouse. Pressure is. There we go. You're good. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Yes. For the opportunity to speak about our master facilities plan. We'll try to go through this quickly, save some uh, questions for the end. Uh, as you recall, back in uh, 2018, there was a committee uh, made up of department heads, elected officials, some representatives from the community that did a, an exhaustive analysis of what our facilities needs are for the county uh, now and, and into the future, looking out about 20 years. So there was a priority list made then, and we've been kind of working through that. We've upgraded it recently to add some things that were missing from a cost standpoint. There was some land, uh, architecture, design fees, some common areas and buildings that were missed. We have updated that. So we now have this list, which has been presented in a public meeting to this commission previously, but it, it has largely the same priority list that we had before, but the costs have been updated, as well as a 5% adder uh, added each year going forward if the project is delayed and we end up doing it in the future instead of right now, we have those costs uh, better quantified. So the top projects now are the coroner's office, the jail expansion, drug treatment center, Meridian driver's license, and a parking garage on 3rd and Myrtle. Those are in various uh, stages of completion. Just real briefly, we go through each one, but this is the new coroner's facility. Uh, it's out near um, R.C. Willie. It adds 39,000 square feet. It's going to go to bid at the end of June, and groundbreaking is scheduled for mid-August. The Ada County Jail is uh, about 75% complete of the design, and it's uh, located on the same campus where the jail is now. And we just had uh, good progress this last week on the acquisition of the property from Derry Gold. So that is uh, moving forward. And we are investigating the possible uh, use of ARPA funding for uh, this project and see if there's an opportunity there. The project will add 53,500 new square feet and 292 beds to the current jail. There's a drug treatment center out uh, near Bishop Kelly High School. Uh, it's 90% uh, complete with the design on that, and we're waiting on uh, the CIP funding, which I think Mr. Beck just uh, presented, uh, for approval for the construction of that. It will almost double the size from 11,000 to 20,000 square feet for the drug court, and uh, it's located near Cole and Franklin Roads. Meridian driver's license. We all know we need uh, another facility for that. That's moving along very well. You can see some of the pictures here of the construction, but it's 11,000 square feet, 16 workstations. Uh, it's located uh, in Meridian on Progress uh, Street. The sheriff has a small footprint in there as well, a substation. There's 106 uh, parking spots, and both the internal and external areas are about 80% complete. We're expecting about the first week of August to be substantially complete with that. So that's coming along very well. Near here, uh, the courthouse on 3rd and Myrtle Street, there's a new parking garage that's uh, substantially complete. County employees are currently parking in that garage. The final punch list was just completed, uh, will be completed next week. So we'll finish off the small little items to be fully completed. It added over 200 parking spaces for the county and the full acceptance is scheduled for later this summer. So what's next? As we go through our priority list of the master facilities plan, and I just mentioned the top projects that are already being worked on, what's kind of on deck? Uh, and these are the projects that would be next up to, to be discussing in the near future as to priority timing and what we want to do. The administration building, courthouse renovation, the second floor remodel of Benjamin Street, if the drug court CIP is approved. The Sheriff's Office Crime Lab, the Public Safety Building Operations 
uh, office and workshop, that group is moving to give the sheriff more prime real estate in the, the main building. And in that space, the sheriff would put office and field services. And then our faces uh, building is something we need to find kind of a, a future plan for that. So briefly on just each of those, uh, I won't spend much time on each of these slides, but the, the administration building we, we've presented before. Uh, the trial court administrator and administrative district judge presented to this board on March 17th of this year, just explaining how crowded this building's getting and how they have uh, you know, great backlog of, of cases and stuff. So for them to expand into this building, it, it requires that the, there be a, a solution for the administrative departments and we would need to to go to a different location to allow the courts to expand and the best option for that would be to uh, find an existing building do a remodel and not have to build a building or a parking garage for our administrative services and there is an opportunity to explore uh, co-locating with state government out at the the HP campus is something that we should consider when we dive into this this is just a list of the departments and their space needs going forward that would go into an administrative space. The courthouse renovation can be done in phases, but you can see from uh, 2002 to today, there's just uh, a great growth in the, the number of judges, the number of cases is backlogged out two years. So uh, it is a growing need that will need to be addressed, but the court cannot expand uh, until we have an administration solution for the other departments to move because we'll have to phase in construction and keep the courts uh, open while we're doing construction, which means other departments have to vacate. This would be a phase solution. So there, there would be pricing and timelines put to each of these phases, but it can, it can be done in three phases. Next project, the, the uh, second floor of the Benjamin uh, campus remodel is remodeling 11,000 square feet vacated by uh, the drug court and remodel of the, the drug court building and uh, movement of the personnel is required prior to this. Elections has uh, expressed interest of moving into this space once it's remodeled. The crime lab for the sheriff's office, it'll uh, expand the crime lab into the narcotics area in the basement of the public safety building. It adds about 1,000 square feet. The expansion uh, needed to make room for the additional lab requirements and mechanical equipment. And there's a new DNA lab that's actually part of this project as well. Right now, the uh, operations group occupies some pretty prime real estate at the public safety building. As you, the bottom picture, as you walk up to the front of the building, immediately on your right, kind of right in the middle of the main buildings, is where operations is now. We're looking at um, moving that space over to where the current fuel island is, and that fuel island will be moved. You can see on the top picture, uh, in the middle on the left there is where the new location would be of the fuel island. Operations would go into the colored uh, triangular piece there in the, the bottom middle, and then that would free up some prime real estate for the sheriff's office. Um, and, and give operations a little bit more room. We currently have 20 employees on that site occupying 6,000 square feet and the, the new space would be about 15,000 square feet. And the sheriff has expressed that th this is uh, a better location for the fuel island also. So they're very much in line with us on this. And this is the space vacated by the operations group when we move this fuel island and the operations group expands. This is the, the space that the sheriff office would move into in their field service expansion. Bases is our Family Justice Center. It's in a pretty old building uh, that used to be used to sell tractors out of uh, many, many years ago. But it's occupied by uh, a variety of different agencies, including Ada County, St. Luke's, St. Alphonsus Department of Health and Welfare, Boise Police Department, Faces Foundation, and University of Idaho. The building is close to 50,000 square feet. We currently occupy about half of that, and the remaining space is used for file storage and file scanning rooms. But if we uh, found another home for faces, we would, we would want to provide them about 50,000 square feet so they have room to grow into. 
So this is just a summary of those projects that I just mentioned that were on deck, and this would be their, their costs and, and the rough priority of importance for those. And th those projects alone totaled in 2022 dollars about $330 million. So uh, a lot of needs on our plate here. And the last slide is just uh, so that we can keep momentum and working on these things. We would like to ask for uh, an allocation of $6 million to be provided. This is what was done last year, and it's used for planning, design, property acquisitions, lease, tenant improvements, um, appraisals, just anything that needs to be done so that when we see an opportunity to move ahead on these projects that the, the funds are there and we can actually make progress and keep going. Um, every year that we wait and don't do these, it's getting at least 5% more expensive, which on th these projects alone is about $15 million adder every year that we wait, the, these prices are going up. So we would just uh, like to ask for $6 million to keep projects moving ahead and chip away at, at our facility needs that we have for, for the county. And the last comment there is just, you know, commitment and direction. We look forward to working with the BOCC to set priorities and get support for meeting the county's pressing facilities needs going forward. So that was quick, but that's yeah. a summary of the master's facilities plan. Th thank you, Jess. Uh, good presentation. Appreciate your efforts. Anybody, any, any questions, uh, Commissioner? Or? Just quickly, Mr. Chair. I might note that I think it was in 2018 you mentioned when this was first put yes. together, and I believe the amount then for facilities was about $258 million, and now it's up to 330 Right. So that's an indication <laughs> of inflation, how much things are yeah. costing. Could you, since um, we've got a couple on deck here, the uh, jail expansion and the drug treatment clinic, could you get to this board the um, associated costs all in, in terms of uh, uh, extra personnel, um, extra operating costs, and then one-time costs for equipment, technology, et cetera. So yes. we know ongoing what the costs will be in Absolutely. addition to the structure. Yeah. Thank you. We'll get that for you. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Do you have thank any you. questions, Commissioner? Well, thank you. Beth. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Jess. Okay. You know, do next steps now, or are we gonna stop for lunch? It's up to you. Um, I would recommend we stop, have our meeting, and then we can just come back right when we wrap up lunch and do next steps. Tee it up for Monday. I won't be here, but I can call in. Oh, you won't? Oh, okay. I can do next steps right now if you want. Give me just a minute to pull things up. Okay. We want to accommodate our uh, our senior county commissioner. <laughs> I've been called a few things, but not senior, but thank you. Well, you are the senior on the board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I like the sound of that. <laughs> you can just call me old. It's okay. <laughs> it's probably under presentations. Are you looking for the decision sheet? Yeah, I'm, hey, looking, yes. yeah, I'm looking for the calculator. Could, um, send us a under presentation. Like, or a hard copy of the. What was that? Excel balancing tool. The one that has all the updated costs on it out over 10 years. Here. Thank you. Don't do that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right. Okay, Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners, just a, a quick overview, and I think Mr. Chairman, you and I will have a further conversation uh, regarding this. So in terms of next steps, um, obviously you, there's a meeting for the elected officials here shortly. Um, on Monday morning, we will begin the deliberative process. I think first we have an executive session uh, just to discuss some legal matters to help inform some of the decisions that you'll be making during deliberations. But then at 10 a.m. on Monday is when deliberations will truly start. Um, and the way that this process works, particularly for you two who are new to it, 
This, now that you've heard, so you've got your budget books, you've heard from the department heads and elected officials in terms of their requests, all the needs, so all the information has been put before you. Now uh, the task before us is to come up with a balanced budget. So making sure that we determine all of our various revenue sources, uh, what we're gonna rely on for revenue, um, also, whether we're going to use savings, I mean, you've heard the word fund balance used quite a few times today. Fund balance would just be using our savings rather than ongoing revenue that's coming in. Um, and then balancing that against the expenses uh, that we plan to budget for in the next year. In terms of the county's budget, just as a reminder, this is that determines the spending authority for the county over the next fiscal year. So from October 1st through September 31st. Um, this is it that uh, Scott, when he was discussing it, he made a really good point that it's really awkward for him to try and figure out his expenses and revenue. Float season just started and he's actually right now asking for next float season, not the one that he's experiencing right now. And so the entire county will be making those decisions. Um, Anthony has developed these great tools that we can use for the deliberation process. I think one of the hardest things if you've I know, Mr. Chairman, you've participated at the state level. They aren't able to operate in real time quite like we are. But as you're making decisions, we'll be actually making those decisions as you go. And you'll get to see where does the budget stand? Is it balanced? Right. And so um, we'll be making those adjustments and tracking the numbers in terms of both the changes and everything else. Um, this is, I don't know, I'm going to figure out how to get it all to fit on the screen. Um, this is the decision tool that we will largely kind of will constantly we'll make a bunch of decisions come back to this this will be a, the base at where we operate um, the yellow dot that you see there um, we have this band we've already done calculations in our office leading into the budget just saying what is our financial standing what do we need to do looking at both what the requested budgets are versus what the revenues that we have coming in are and then what our tolerance for the use of fund balance is. Um, oddly right now, this will be the first budget. I've been doing this for, I've been standing here doing this for a decade. And this is the first time that the dot is on the right side of this bar. It always is over here, usually somewhere in like the red orange area on the left. Um, so right now what's actually showing is based on the information that we have plugged in at the moment, uh, we exceed, we're taking $6 million more in taxes than we should is what this would be saying if we were to leave it as is. Now, mind you, there are a whole bunch of decisions that haven't been made here to fund things. So that's why it's not, that's not an accurate reflection of our standing by any means. This doesn't include supplementals, doesn't include a lot of things. Um, but what we'll be able to do is just go through, uh, discuss, for example, property taxes, whether we wanna take any of the 3%, new construction, foregone. If we wanna cut taxes, we have that built in. We'll make decisions regarding merit, COLA, health uh, care premium increases, um, we do have a line here for the master's facility plan, as we just discussed. Uh, Jess was asking for $6 million. This is where we would put that $6 million in if we were going to fund it. Um, we do have built in at the moment, the, uh, as a separate decision, the coroner's facility lease payment. Uh, it's defaulted is in there at the moment, but we'll discuss that. Um, uh, we have decisions for EMS. That, again, that's a separate budget, but we want to make sure this up here is on the those in the 3% cap funds, because that's where a lot of the big decisions are. Um, in terms of going through and making decisions, we have a, a few different um, things to go through. This first tab, I'll walk through this in greater detail next week. So just bear with me on that part. But this first tab, these are uh, to a certain degree, just kind of pro forma things for you to approve. Um, these are re constant renewals that we have to do. So um, I was going to say copiers, but that's not what pops up right there. I can, we'll go through what these are, but these are things that we already have, the expenses that already exist legal and Heather can explain them is just asking for you to approve the renewal of these because they, they would otherwise be multi-year agreements, but since we can't have multi-year agreements, we go through this pro forma approving these, what otherwise are realistically multi-year agreements. Um, nothing of it of too excitement here, but so we'll go through that quickly next week. Um, we also have a sheet as uh, Richard just addressed for decision making re regarding the capital improvement program. So being able to actually discuss and say yes or no 
to those things that the transformation board submitted to you and what we want to fund there. And we'll add those in. So you'll see, start to see this throughout where we have these decision making points. And I can just say, and, and get used, to, I think you're kind of used to this, but this will be the extreme version of this where I will be constantly looking for feedback from all three of you. And until I see at least two heads nods or some affirmation by two of you, I may stand and stare at you until something happens. Uh, so get used to that. Um, but we'll be going through and making some decisions there. Similarly, we have the extraordinary operating expenses, just as Richard presented, make decisions there. The, the order that we go in this, Mr. Chairman, you'll largely be determining the order. There's we have them stacked this way. There's no rhyme or reason to why we need to go through. And actually, sometimes it's easier to go to smaller stuff and then do bigger stuff uh, as we go through the decisions. Um, also, and I think you guys have a, a strong interest in this just to show that we'll be going over it. Obviously, I have to adjust things. Um, there's two, the next two are, are ones that just, there's a, quite a bit of it. So you'll notice as I scroll through, these are those supplemental requests. So the departments as they were presenting were mentioning, you know, they had their base that they had so many expenses, but they were also asking for X, Y, or Z. Uh, the, these supplementals, the detail of these are in your budget books. Um, but we will go through each of those supplemental requests individually and you will approve or deny each of those supplementals. And we'll go through one by one and, and work through those. And then similarly, um, we have a number of personnel decisions to make. Um, I'll go through the color coding and whatnot next week, um, but we'll go through, these are the positions. These are not all of the positions within Ada County. There is a, a presumption that you're gonna continue to pay at the same rate people that are currently employed, unless you say otherwise, which will be a surprise to that person. Um, the, these are though all of the special salary adjustments, shifting part-time to full-time, new positions and other things. And we'll walk through individually, but you will make a decision on each of these. Now we can kind of do them in groupings, but uh, we'll go through this. We'll go department by department uh, through making decisions on, on these as well. Um, and let's see, uh, this, uh, I'll, I'll give a little better, but this is one of the things, this is new in terms of Anthony, I'm gonna switch back to the main screen because the same thing on the decision sheet is well, let's see where are we oh here you go right here um so that's that last screen i showed is a more detailed variation of this it's you know what is the homeowner going to experience right so we'll be in addition to calculating the budget we'll be trying to make educated uh, guesses in terms of what the um, impact to a property taxpayer is so uh, median home value uh, what the property taxes would be and what the difference would be based on the decisions that we're making. All right, we can, so we can talk through that. We've got examples so that you can be, because I know one of the questions, is not just figuring out the budget, but what does this mean for the citizens? And so we'll be walking through that. So, uh, you know, the first few hours of the deliberation process, it will probably just me guiding you through what are relatively the easier decisions. It's kind of, we'll take the low hanging fruit, walk through it, check back in where we stand, walk through it, and then we'll start to get into the real discussion items and you guys will have discussions with each other. This, is a, this will also be the forum for you to talk to each other. There may be points where it's just a discourse among you trying to figure out what your priorities are, right? And so we'll be walking through that next week. But the time is scheduled. We've got quite a bit of time scheduled next week. It's really for a dialogue and a discussion between you and with Kathleen and I to figure out the actual tentative budget that we want to adopt. Um, so that's kind of where we stand and we'll, like I said, we'll walk through all of that, but we've got it teed up so that we have the information. Um, again, if for some reason you have in the back of your brain a question you want answered, I would encourage you to reach out to whomever the most appropriate entity uh, for that is um, and so that we can get you that information sooner. It does become difficult. There almost inevitably will be a question that pops up during deliberations. It's just the turnaround because you now then you it, it hold, holds up the process if we don't have the information we need. So hopefully you've got most of your answers at this point. Um, unless there's any questions, which we'll have. I'd have a question. Uh, we're, we will be establishing the tentative budget, but we will not actually establish the, the, 
the, the budget officially establish the budget until August, correct? You actually, this is a great question. In all practical purposes, largely because of our calendars more than anything else, we will be adopt, we will be establishing the tentative budget. There's a lot of behind the scenes work then that Kathleen and Tim need to do to really make sure it is, you know, all of the zeros are in the right places and decimal points. Um, you are going to go into BOE and <laughs> and it's like a black hole. We just we won't see you for a few weeks. Um, so while you are doing that, we will be working on it on July 21st. Uh, I between then and July 21st, too, we will be working with the elected officials, and department heads to prepare a presentation to give to the public saying, here is our budget. Here are the highlights. Here's the expenses and revenues we can share in the very first um, week of August is when you'll actually officially adopt the tentative budget. It'll be in your open business meeting. Uh, there will be a motion after we've done all that cleanup, you'll adopt the tentative budget at that point. The budget can no longer go up it can only go down so that's all still there's still opportunity for the public to provide feedback to you and say oh my gosh phil's presentation says you're i don't know nothing i can't think of anything fun or exciting to say um but uh they can t ask you to cut it uh, we will be publishing the budget uh, in the paper uh, one of those statesmans that we <laughs> won't be receiving and uh the then we will adopt i don't know if it's the end of august or early september the final budget august 9th for the final or for the tentative final okay yeah so, yeah okay well i thank you i'm sure we will have a lot of questions as we go on the way as we proceed so do we have any anything else for phil if not we'll be uh we'll be adjourned all right thank you thank you mr chairman